call the uh, Sheboygan Common Council Committee of the Whole meeting of Wednesday, September 14th, 2011 to order. Let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Alderperson Kittleson will be taking the uh, minutes of tonight's meeting. Uh, would you please call the roll? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. Bell. Here. Corrin. Here. Carlson. Here. Decker. Here. Hammond. Here. Hammond. Here. Heideman. Excused. Kott. Here. Kittleson is here. Matichek. Excused. Rindfleisch. Here. Raisler. Here. Sampson. Here. Van Akron. Here. Vanderweel. Here. Versi. Here. We have uh, 14, 14 present. We have a quorum present. Thank you. Uh, before we get started, we are on television tonight, so all our persons, please uh, use your microphones. We are live tonight. Uh, for those uh, who have friends that could not make it tonight, uh, you can contact uh, Carrie Kautzer at WSCS-TV at 459-6663. That's 459-6663 for the dates that this meeting will be replayed. And uh, Mr. Kautzer is available Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So if you have friends or neighbors that couldn't attend and they want to watch the replay, that's who to contact. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the public forum. And what I'm going to do tonight with the public forum is I'm going to divide it into two parts. The first part of the public forum is going to be pertaining to the items on the agenda number seven and eight. Uh, pertaining to obtaining legal counsel. And then uh, we'll, we'll hear all of those people who want to speak on that topic. And then part two of the uh, uh, public forum tonight is going to be to the items uh, 12 through 17 pertaining uh, the discussion about a city administrator. So what I'll do is I'll hear that we'll hear the people first <coughs> that want to speak on items, uh, agenda items seven and eight. And then when we get to items number 12 through 17 on the agenda, then we will proceed to hear those people who want to speak on the city administrator. So first, I'd be interested in hearing anybody who wants to speak on uh, items 7 and 8. Now, also, we have some, some uh, communications from constituents. I believe those are items number uh, 9, 10, and 11. I will call on those people specifically when we get to those agenda items. So with that said, is there anybody that wants to be heard on agenda <coughs> items number seven and eight? Uh, yes, sir. Step forward, please. Thank you. Uh, before we hear from you, uh, Mr. Gillette, uh, I need a, uh, a motion to approve the minutes from August 25th. So move for a second. I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from August 25th. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes aye. For the record, sir, would you like to give your name and address? My name is Patrick Gillette, 915 North Avenue, City of Sheboygan. You will have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of this council and committee. I've stood before this committee several times before. I have introduced two valid citizens' taxpayer complaints in accordance to municipal ordinance and state statutes. There's an established rule of law that an action lies in favor of the complainant. You've all taken an oath to see this process through. This complaint process is clearly spelled out, and so is your duty to follow it. Various members of this council, committee, arbitrarily and capri capriciously have delayed this action. At this time, you're in a civil venue. There is another venue. State statutes also govern your actions. Do not let your opinions overshadow your responsibilities. This matter must be pursued by this entire council committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gillette. Anybody else like to be heard? Yes, ma'am. Step forward.
Could we have your name and address, please? Patricia Ahom, 2602A Camelot Boulevard. We'll have three minutes. Like the many citizens that need to have the investigative process conducted in order to remove Mayor Ryan from the helm, I urge you to vote tonight to hire Attorney Biscupic. Because the conduct of this mayor has destructively eroded the reputation of our city, we simply cannot condone his terrible behavior and we will never be satisfied to have the complaints against him swept under the rug. We expect our older persons to step up to the plate to preserve the integrity of City Hall. The call for this quasi-judicial hearing has not been taken lightly. In fact, it's been debated, discussed, and questioned for at least six weeks. These are huge, reprehensible wrongdoings with far-reaching public relations and economic effects. The only precedent that would be set is if you do not go forward with the investigation and conceivably the quasi-judicial hearing. In spite of the many, many requests and opportunities for him to resign for the good of the city, Bob Ryan continues in his arrogant, cunning, and controlling ways to hold the city hostage by his threats and promises to make the taxpayers pay heavily if they try to remove him from office. Talk about bullying the older persons who are now required to vote to devote all their time, energy, and effort on what is just a part-time job for them, while he smugly sits in his undeserved seat receiving over $104,000 a year in salary and benefits. If the Common Council does not vote to hire Attorney Biscupic and proceed with the investigation, it will set a precedent for allowing misconduct in public office in that anyone guilty of public drunkenness and defamation of the city's goodwill integrity, honesty, and forthrightness in the future will know that nothing's going to happen to them because Mayor Ryan got away with it. You, the older persons, are the only ones who can stand up with courage to change the things going on and to demonstrate that this type of action on the part of this mayor cannot and will not be tolerated. I realize this entire mess caused by the mayor's self-centered actions has been a huge strain on you and you may be tempted to agree to anything just to make the whole thing go away. But please do not give in to Ryan's tactics. But continue this bold and courageous fight to remove this thorn from office. You will never get another chance at a pro bono offer like Attorney Biscubics to investigate, rectify, and resolve this contentious matter. Don't blow this opportunity to stand up and be counted for your courage. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else want to be heard? Ma'am? <clears throat> Actually, I want to speak on both subjects. Can I speak again? Uh, I'll call on you for the second. Thank you. <clears throat> your name and address, please. Dulcie Johnson, 1306 North 3rd Street, Sheboygan. Briefly, I would just urge you to move forward and retain an attorney to investigate the citizen complaints that you have received about Mayor Ryan. I think it is your obligation, it is your responsibility, I think it is part of your job description. When all of this first began, it seemed that the council was calling for citizens to submit letters of complaints so that they could proceed. And several citizens have submitted letters in good faith and I think you need to honor that. Thank you. You. Does anybody else want to be heard? Yes, sir. Step forward. Uh, do we have your name and address? Richard Susha, 15 North Point Drive, Sheboygan, Wisconsin. We'll have three minutes. I'm going to split this up and I'll reserve my other comments for later about the administrator. There's been a lot of character assassination in the past weeks, and I've been part of it, but it's all true. A person can disagree with our mayor's policies, but our mayor's image should be above reproach. Yes, the mayor's job is 24-7, and he lives in a fishbowl. I should know it was 12 years. Whether he likes it or not, he lives in a fishbowl if not, get out of the kitchen. 
I will not reiterate my remarks of the past. You all have copies of my <coughs> letters and emails. So I strongly urge you to continue the investigation for removal as well as a recall effort. Trust has been broken and will never be restored with this mayor. Therefore, tonight, you need to pass and recommend the council pursue an ongoing investigation utilizing the pro bono attorney services, and let's get on with this job tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to be heard? Does anybody wish to be heard? For a third time, does anybody wish to be heard? Okay, we'll move on to agenda item number six, and that's the chairman's comments. Just have a couple brief comments. <clears throat> last, at last Tuesday night's council meeting, we voted to proceed with the removal process. Tonight, items seven and eight pertain only to approval of hiring of legal uh, uh, of, of attorneys uh, for that process. And also, <coughs> the attorneys are here this evening to answer any of your questions. So let's move on. Those are my comments. <coughs> Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Were you going to allow the public comments now on the city administrator, or are you going to wait till that point in the agenda? At that point in the agenda. Items for discussion and possible recommendation to the Common Council start out with item number seven on the agenda, Council document number 1061. I'm sorry. It's a typo. I'm sorry. 1161. A resolution authorizing the Common Council to engage the services of special outside counsel to represent the city of Sheboygan in the role of special prosecutor with regard to a quasi-judicial hearing. Uh, Attorney Stephen M. Biskupic of Michael Best and Frederick LLP is, a, is in attendance and will be available to answer questions from the older persons. Uh, Alderman Versi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, motion to approve and send a positive recommendation to the full council this document. Second. We have a motion and a second. Thank you, Alderman Versi, for that motion. Thank you for the second. Alderman Decker. And we have a motion and a second to uh, <coughs> send this to the council with a positive recommendation to go ahead and hire council. And now I will open it up for discussion. Uh, do any aldermen have any comments or questions or would like to uh, address any questions. Alderman Hammond. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would uh, ask that uh, Attorney Biskupic be open the floor to be Attorney Biskupic, please. <coughs> would you step forward, please, Attorney Biskupic? <coughs> Alderman Hammond, if you don't mind, I just want to ask Attorney Biskupic, oh. something before you proceed? No, I just wanted to get oh. him up here. All right. Before we open it up for questions, Attorney Biskupic, first of all, welcome, and thanks for coming up to Sheboygan tonight. Uh, did you have any prepared marks that you wanted to make before we get into questions from the older persons? Uh, I don't, other than to reiterate, I think, what's implied in the proceedings, and that is the position as I see it, is totally under the statute, Wisconsin 17-16, no more, no less. Uh, the power to and the obligation to investigate and to have somebody serve in the role of prosecutor, I think has been recognized by the Wisconsin Supreme Court. But, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to go forward. It can be, you know, like any prosecutorial discretion or recommendation to the body not to go forward if the facts don't justify it or if the facts justify it to go forward. I tell you now, I, I really don't know all the facts in detail. I've looked at the complaints, I'm waiting for the council to act. Uh, I'd also say I don't really have a dog in this fight. I don't know the mayor. I don't think I know any of you. We've offered our services. It's uh, the type of work I'm experienced in. I enjoy doing it. Uh, we're willing to do it pro bono, unless you want to pay us. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure you can afford us. But anyway, I, I think the most important thing is to recognize that the power is solely within the statute no more, no less, and one of those provisions in the statute is to move promptly, and that would be my intention if you approve this. Thank you. Are there any, any questions from the older persons? Uh, Alderman Sampson, you're first. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Attorney Buskiva, can you just explain why you would be doing it pro bono in the process by which you're doing that? Well, um, my understanding is that uh, someone in your city attorney's office contacted my partner in Manitowoc, uh, Kathleen Reynolds, uh, asked her if our law firm would be interested in working on this. Uh, she looked into it and said we would. Uh, she contacted me in Milwaukee, knew I was experienced in these type of things. Uh, we came up, we met with uh, the three members and were interviewed. And it's fairly obvious that if you start these endeavors, any kind of special prosecutor, you're, you're looking at big cost. And the idea that our firm would charge you tens of thousands of dollars, you know, I think would be a big detriment. So talk to my partners and agreed to offer to do it pro bono. I mean, again, if it's something where you think there's something not right about that offer, you can pay us. I mean, <laughs> we do plenty of other pro bono work and, you know, it's not like we need to do it, but we're willing to do it. And again, it's an offer and if you want to accept it, great. And if you don't, no harm taken. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Alderman Thank Sampson. You. Alderman Riesler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a time frame, roughly, that you think that this is going to well, take? Well, the statute says move promptly, and I think a lot of that is uh, dictated by facts that are uncovered, how cooperative witnesses are, and what you learn. If, if everything that's learned is everything that you know right now, then it'll move very quickly. If there's new information or other information comes forward or people are not cooperative, then it may drag on. But, but I mean promptly, as in, you know, if this had started six weeks ago, I think it, I mean, it was my expectation we'd be done by now. So, but again, I don't, I don't want to promise that it'll be done in six weeks if there are facts and circumstances. Uh, I will give it my prompt attention, my immediate attention, subject to the other demands of my other clients. But there's, just because you take something on pro bono, you don't give it, you know, uh, second class treatment. I would, I would make sure that we give this the attention it deserves right away. Just a couple Go ahead. questions. Uh, and then I'm just looking at, um, Cost for subpoena and witness fees? Is that well, going to be paid for by the city or is how The statute provides that and I guess again it depends on you know where witnesses are coming from, whether the proceeding is necessary, how detailed it is, um, but those are considerations that are made you know by any city attorney, district attorney, state attorney every day. And, uh, but there will be some cost to, to us with, uh, with that. I assume on those witnesses, I mean say it was $40 a day or witness fee if that's what the statute is incorporated. So I think those are aspects, what the Wisconsin Supreme Court has, I think, instructed in these <coughs> circumstances is that you have to have due process. And if due process means that somebody needs, you know, you need a witness fee to get someone there, then you have to do it. If they appear voluntarily or willing to come, then, then you don't. So a lot of that is, I think, to be seen, how far this goes and how long it takes. Again, I, I do not know. Sure, and there's two more things. Uh, and then the investigation costs as far as the investigators doing the investigation, the law firm is going to pay for that or is there going to be some? Well, it'd be my, uh, you know, some of this is still to be determined, but it would my assumption that the investigative costs uh, that are borne by some, let me say this, in other instances where our law firm has been involved with other municipalities around this state, they have utilized the services of uh, local law enforcement. Uh, that doesn't mean it's a criminal investigation. That means they're empowered to enforce Wisconsin statutes. To the extent that conflicts of interest arise because, say, a you know, police department is under the executive branch of the government, then you look elsewhere for assistance. Uh, I've started to analyze those issues and, and haven't um, you know, fully gone down that path. And again, a lot depends on how cooperative people are and how much of a need there is for that type of assistance. So if there's an outside investigator required, that would be another fee that we would have? No, I would assume that that would be uh, somebody who's employed uh, by the public and would be doing that as part of their duties. You have a Wisconsin statute that sets forth the process. Uh, my assumption is that uh, a law enforcement agency would assist. Okay. And, and then just the last thing I have, if you could just clarify, the statute requires that we make sure that the complaint is valid, correct? First step that your city step, attorney right. has already done. Right. There is nothing in it that specifically says that we have to investigate. Huh. Correct? Well, I'm a, on those procedural aspects, that's why my understanding is that you're going to contemplate hiring uh, Mr. Volkner is that he will serve as your city attorney and give you legal advice in terms of those procedures. My role would be investigate the facts, 
present them if warranted and go from there. And if they're not, go home. Anything else, Alderman Riesler? No, I'm fine, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Alderman Hammond. Thank you. Um, first off, thank you, Attorney Biskupic, for uh, your generous offer um, and your willingness to come here tonight. Uh, just a couple questions um, to kind of dovetail up. Can you outline the process of how this would, would go down? I, I understand your comment earlier about uh, um, Attorney Volkner being our city attorney, but the investigation, are, are the witnesses required? Do you have subpoena power at that point? Or, you yes, know, the okay. statute gives subpoena power. The statute says the witnesses can be compelled to appear. They won't appear voluntarily. So the first step is determine the facts. And you already have a framework that has to be approved, that has been approved under the statute. You talk to the witnesses and then there has to be a document presented. Due process has to be presented to the mayor and his attorney in at least 10 days to consider that information, to get to mount a defense. You know, and then it's really the council to set a procedure of going forward if they're gonna have a quasi-judicial hearing. And again, I don't, you know, some of this I'll defer again to Attorney Volkner, but as I see the statute and our firm has worked on it in the past is, you know, you, you can have all kinds of allegations and you can assume that even if they're true, you would not go forward and move to dismiss them. And, and that is, you know, one possibility at the other end of the spectrum is you think they're really serious and you want to go forward and then you have to give the mayor and his attorney and uh, their witnesses due process. So, you know, where, which end of the spectrum, where this is going to fall, I, I can't answer that question right now. And I don't think anyone would at the beginning of an investigation. You all have an assumption of what facts are, but like we tell juries at the beginning of the case, you've got to, got to ignore those assumptions and rely upon only what facts are discovered. So, if I could. I just, go ahead. So if we go ahead as a, as a body and, and hire you, that would give you the subpoena power you would need? Give me the authority to investigate. I'm not going to go out and interview witnesses on behalf of the council without your passing the resolution, without giving the authority under 17.16. That's how I see it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess just to reconfirm there's going to be no cost then from your law firm to investigate and look into these matters uh, as far as witness fees subpoena fees those would all come at a later point once the hearing is called for is that correct that's my understanding and i did say if there's something unforeseen some witness in alaska or something will come back to the council and say okay there's an expense to have to fly somewhere let's talk about how that you know whether that's worth the time and the money but to sort of guess ahead of time that we're going to have this expense and it's not worth it or it is worth it, I think is premature. I mean, right now, the lawyer fees are the things that would be the biggest costs. And as I said, we wanted to do it pro bono. So at this point, there's no fee for you to look into this. It would come at a later time, if at all. And then again, you had reiterated before that you would look into this and the timeline would play out at that point. You would um, submit something to the mayor, I'm assuming something to the well, council as yeah, well. Yeah, it has to be in writing. It's, there's no doubt that it has to be a, a written, something that spells out exactly what. You can't just have this gray area, he's not a good mayor, or he's a terrific mayor, or whatever your opinion is. It has to be, these are the actions that you think the witnesses can prove, or excuse me, that the testimony and the evidence will prove. And, you know, then it's, as I read the Supreme Court of Wisconsin decisions interpreting that statute, you have to give the mayor and his lawyer all the opportunity to challenge that within reason and within due process. And that means allowing them to confront witnesses. And those witnesses won't come voluntarily. They can be compelled under the statute. The statute uh, provides that any witness who testifies uh, gets immunity. And just so you know, I, I think that's going to mean the mayor, too. So uh, they can be removed from office, but he, his words at a hearing under oath can't be used against him in some other proceeding, then, at least as I interpret the statute right now. So after the investigation would take place, you, you would submit something to the mayor as well as, as I'm assuming, to the city, yes. indicating yes. your findings and whether you believe it would be appropriate to move forward with yes. a type of hearing or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and, and as I envision it, again, because the council is supposed to be the jury, you know, you set this process in motion and then you're supposed to step back and be impartial. It's very, very difficult. And again, the Wisconsin Supreme Court has dealt with that and said you, just, you have to take an oath to be impartial. That Attorney Volkner would serve as the contact, the liaison, and that I would communicate to you through him. So there's not separate communication. 
And I guess just one last question. If, if for some reason you find that there isn't um, suitable evidence, there isn't um, something substantial to move forward, you wouldn't recommend that? Or even if you did find that there was something substantial, you had indicated that this body could then also decide at that point right. to not go forward with the process. So we would have the option after the investigation is completed to say either there's, there's no substance to the complaints or that at that point, even if there is some substance, we choose not to go forward. Yeah, I mean, look, at, let's say you had a complaint that the mayor jaywalked and witnesses, 10 witnesses saw it. You know, you could vote to say, well, even though you have this petition and even though you have 10 witnesses that say it, we don't think that rises to the level of removal, we vote to stop it, at least as I understand it. You always retain that right. At the other end of the spectrum, if you think it's serious enough, you get to go forward. So again, I see, the role that you're contemplating for me is the gathering and presenting of facts and then advocating whether to go forward or not. But there's nothing in hiring myself or Mr. Volkner that abdicates any of your duties under the statute. I think the statute lays out a procedure and as I said before, it instills certain powers to do things no more, no less. It's not gonna be the, it doesn't solve all the problems and uh, it's just a framework to go forward. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the older persons? Alderman Hammond. Uh, thank you. I just, clarification on a comment you just made, sure. uh, sir. You, you mentioned that everybody gets immunity. Yeah. Um, and so if you interview, you know, the mayor or a department head or something like that, going back to the mayor's comment, if, he, if you interview him, you can't use that in, in the next proceeding or the removal process or the quasi-judicial, did I understand that right? Or if I'm not an attorney, obviously. Immunity means uh, that under, as I understand it, and again, this, these are things why you need another attorney to advise the council almost on as your legal advisor as opposed to the advocate is, you know, that the statute provides under 1712 that witnesses can be compelled that there is subpoena power. However, the witnesses who testify at the hearing, what they say cannot be used against them in some other proceeding. Oh, okay. Some, I got it. You okay, know, thank so you. So someone wants to get on the stand and say they stole a bike when they were 12, the district attorney's out of luck. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Are there any other questions? I see no lights, so uh, Alderperson Kittleson, would you please call the roll? We have a motion and a second to uh, proceed in hiring outside legal services of Attorney Stephen M. Biskupic and of Michael Best and Frederick LLP. I did have one more light go on. Alderman yeah. Raisler. I, I guess I'm just kind of a little confused. I, I think we're done asking the questions of the attorney, but I don't know if we're done with the discussion on, on this portion, because I do have one other comment then, not for the attorney. This, if, if I'm, uh, yes. may I be excused then? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you again. I, I do just have one other comment, if I may. Go ahead, um, I did uh, speak with a constituent this week uh, who advised me that the local bar association uh, had some displeasure in the fact that we did not look at any uh, local attorney to hire uh, and I guess I would just uh, concur with that, that at least we should have opened it up somehow to, to see if there was any, in, anyone interested. I understand there may be some conflicts of interest, but um, we try to keep our, our contracting for some of the services. We try to go local, and, and in this uh, uh, process, we did not. So I guess I'm just stating that for my, my opinion and the opinion of some other people that I've talked to. Thank you, Alderman Riesler. Is there any other comments? Alderman Person Kittles, would you please call the roll? All right. Belt. Aye. Warren. Uh, aye. Carlson. No. Decker. Aye. Hammond. No. Hammond. No. Heideman is excused. Kittleson. Aye. Matichek is excused. Rinfleisch. Aye. Raisler? No. Sampson? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? No. Versi? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Did I miss Julie? I'm so sorry. Kath is aye. I didn't miss anyone else, I hope. Thank you. One, two. We have nine ayes, one, two, three, four, five noes. Motion carries. Next we'll move on to uh, council uh, uh, agenda item number eight, which is council document number 1160, 
a resolution authorizing the Common Council to engage the legal services of special outside legal counsel to represent the council with regard to a quasi-judicial hearing and authorizing payment for said services. Uh, and then uh, Attorney uh, uh, Joseph J. Volkner of Olson, Cloet, Gunderson, and Conway is in attendance and will be available to answer any questions from the older persons. Alderman Versi. Hey, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve and send a positive recommendation to the full council. Second. We have a motion and a second to send a positive recommendation to the council. Uh, we'll now open it up for discussion. Uh, let's see, I think uh, Alderman Hammond was first. Um, again, I just uh, asked Mr. Chair that uh, we open the floor to Attorney Volkner. Would you step forward, Attorney Volkner? Thank you, Alderman Hammond. You're welcome. Alderman Raisler, you will be first. I, I can see my, mine's a comment, not necessarily for the attorney. Someone just a comment when we're done with the question. You want to wait later? Yes, please. Okay. Alderman Hammond. Thank you. Um, I think you probably heard, uh, first off, thank you very much for, for uh, attending, but um, I think you heard the question earlier about our obligation under this process. And again, um, as what could be perceived as the council's attorney, could you go through that and explain, you know, statutorily what our obligations are, you know, those types of things? Sure, I'll, I'll address it up front what the role of, of my representing the Common Council would Please. be. My responsibility in the process, as I understand it, is to provide uh, the parties and Mayor Ryan and his council, as well as all the parties involved with due process of law. Um, a, uh, a holder of public office holds a property right. Uh, and that property right cannot be deprived, in a, such as a removal process, cannot be deprived from a person without due process of law. That is, is they're provided with ample and appropriate procedural aspects, including a hearing, including the opportunity to cross-examine witnesses, including the opportunity to have certain uh, procedural safeguards included in that process to ensure that if removal is the ultimate uh, finding of, of this body, um, that uh, uh, the mayor has had an opportunity to be heard as well as his counsel, as well as to mount an appropriate defense. And I think Attorney Biskupic touched on some of those initial aspects uh, of that particular proceeding. Follow up, if I may, sir. Go ahead. Um, our obligation as a counsel to go forward, um, again, Attorney Biskupic kind of said that would be more in your realm. Um, are we obligated to take that to the investigation? Are we obligated to take it after that? Uh, what, what is this council's obligation when it comes to furthering the process? The complaints. Your, yours is an huh? interest. The citizen complaints? Yeah. The, I'm sorry. He was clarifying for me. He was talking about the citizen's complaints. Right. With respect to the uh, complaints in the matter, the statute is, is relatively uh, unclear as to whether there's an obligation of the body to go forward. I would submit to you, in, in my, my opinion, that there does exist at least some responsibility to investigate the allegations of a citizen complaint. As to whether the body, the adjudicative body, decides whether it wishes to go forward after hearing Attorney Biskupic uh, uh, and his investigation having been completed, that's a function of this body to determine as, as to whether they choose to go forward. And as uh, Attorney Biskupic stated, um, you know, it's, it's a weight and credibility and a, and, a, and a determination of this particular body to determine whether it believes it should go forward or may go forward or may make whatever choice it determines uh, with respect to those allegations and the, I guess what I'll call the end product of, of Mr. Biskupic's investigation. So essentially at that point we become a DA determining whether we want to charge or not. I'm not sure that that's a fair analogy, okay. but it, maybe it's uh, similar, perhaps. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the uh, attorney? Uh, Alderman Haman, I believe, is first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would you um, please stand? Sure. Thank you. Uh, if we were to go forward with this, then who would run the hearing? Well, that's a determination that it may be a bit premature. And, and the reason for that is, is there are a lot of options. It is my understanding, based on the statute and the case law uh, that Attorney Biskupic referenced previously, is that the president of the council has that responsibility, at least outright. Um, and that's because of his unique position as president. Um, but 
there's nothing to say in the statute or the, 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 the case law that suggests that some other person uh, cannot be selected to do that. All right, so that is an option that this body has, is to make a determination as to who it might wish if either uh, Mr. Rinfleisch cannot or is unwilling, or it's determined that the body believes that someone else should hear the matter, that is certainly appropriate as well. Okay, and then uh, say we get to that point, uh, is there a time frame that we could be looking at for how the length of the hearing? Is there a, a speculation on that? I, I don't, I, I, I don't want to speculate as to the amount of time it may take, and, and that, I hate to give answers that start with it depends, but it really does in this case. It depends on the nature of the allegations, what proof is out there, how many witnesses have to appear, what kinds of documentary evidence is out there. Um, obviously, as I referenced earlier, Mayor Ryan and his council have an opportunity to mount an appropriate defense based on those allegations. I'm not going to speak for uh, his attorneys as to how long they may take in doing that or I'm not going to speak for Attorney Biskupic either and how long it may take him. It's really a matter of what he discovers and what evidence is presented and how long it may take to do that. I, I could not give you a fair time frame. I do not know that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Alderman Hammon. I believe Alderman Van Akron is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Attorney Velkner, if you can just touch on your role as far as the immediate, um, I, I guess the, the immediate proceeding that we're looking at being the investigation alone. Can you touch on what your role would be involved in the investigation and what of any cost would be absorbed through the city or what would be charged to the city for your role in strictly the investigation portion of this? Well, I'll, I'll start by saying is that my role in the investigation is not to investigate. That is not my role in, this, in, this, in these proceedings. It, it, my role would be, and I, I think this is a good point to discuss this, is my role would be in the event that a quasi-judicial hearing is decided upon by this body. Uh, my role would be at that point, as I mentioned earlier, to ensure due process. Mr. Biskupic himself is going to be strictly responsible for the investigatory phase, I guess I'll call it, of, of these proceedings. My role in that, as he touched on earlier and, and deferred to me on, was I would serve as a liaison for uh, not only Mr. Biskupic, but for uh, the mayor and his council uh, to address issues concerning evidence, concerning witnesses, concerning the issuance of subpoenas and other matters. Um, and I would certainly uh, have involvement in that particular matter. In terms of fact finding, in terms of interviewing witnesses, in terms of obtaining of documents, anything of the sort, Alderman, I, I would not be involved in that in any way. Um, and I, I want to clarify that point as well. I do not view my role uh, in these proceedings as anything adversarial whatsoever. My responsibility is to preserve the integrity of the process, to make sure uh, that Mayor Ryan and all the parties are provided with appropriate due process of law. Um, and that is my role and one I take very seriously. It's very important to the integrity of the process. But I do not have any opinion. I do not take any position with respect to any of the substantive merits of the case, uh, that is simply not my role. My role is to advise the council as to how to proceed and how to provide the due process that I talked about previously. I, I hope that wasn't too long-winded and I hope it answers your question. No, j just to follow up then, excuse me, just to follow up, so as far as the investigation and going forward with an investigation, it, it sounds to me that your role would be then taken up after that investigation is completed and, and letters are submitted to the city as well as the mayor. So, so really to go forward with an investigation, there would be little to no cost for, from your firm to the city? It, that's conceivable and a lot depends again and again I, 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 I hate to give answers that start with it depends. However, it, 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 again, it, it may be determined on the amount of witnesses that have to be interviewed. Or, or the amount or subpoenas that have to be issued. It could be any number of different factors. I, I quite frankly don't view my initial role in advising the council as um, a particularly involved process. My job is to simply help the parties move forward, both the mayor and uh, Attorney Biskupic, and, and, and provide whatever assistance I can to everybody. That's how I view my role. Thank you, Alderman Van Akron. Uh, if I could just insert something here. Attorney Valkner, I believe the amount that you agreed on to represent the council was $185 an hour, is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. I, I think that was part of it, Alderman Van Akron's question, but right. uh, Alderman, uh, President Rinfleisch. Uh, thank you. 
Um, two questions. One, are you a member of the local bar? That, that is an issue that came up earlier. I'm making sure that we support I, I, local. Yes, I am a member of the Sheboygan County Bar, yes. Okay. So in some aspect, at least, we are keeping things local. Uh, if we do go ahead and, and uh, agree to hire you as counsel. Uh, second is, if you would, um, because your role is unique at, in this position, mm -hmm. being counsel to counsel and making sure that you process. Uh, I, I know, having said on law licensing and gone through uh, quasi-judicial hearings with you, but could you perhaps speak on your experience in that particular role that it's not something that's new to you? Sure. Um, I have been uh, involved in uh, law and licensing issues with the city of Sheboygan, including uh, I wouldn't have any ideas to the number of particular proceedings I've conducted and sat and presided over many quasi-judicial hearings, which include uh, many different aspects, including things from uh, liquor licenses to bartenders licenses to contractor licenses to any number of different property issues whenever the city makes a determination that it's going to suspend, revoke, uh, those kinds of things. I've been involved in those proceedings and I've been doing so for approximately nine years. Um, um, I've had many different, uh, I, some of you I do know and have worked with before, some of you I do not, um, but uh, um, you know, in terms of my overall experience, I have been representing the city of Sheboygan in civil matters uh, since my graduation from law school in 2001. Um, and I've been involved in civil defense matters, including injury accidents and other things for the city. But with respect to these proceedings, um, I've been doing them for the city for quite some time. And uh, um, I view this proceeding as very similar to others. Maybe the scope is different, some would argue but we still have to apply the same due process, whether it be a bartender's license or whether it be an issue such as this as removal. We still have to do as a body, and I still have to advise this body as to how to proceed, and I, that is a duty that I take very seriously. And I, I hope that's responsive to your question. Thank you, President Rinfleisch. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and again, <clears throat> thanks for the multiple opportunities to talk. Typically, we don't get that many times to talk. Um, and again, appreciate you um, allowing us to ask questions. It's obviously a huge deal, and we want to make sure we have all the I's dotted and T's crossed. But you made a comment earlier that um, in this example, Alderman Renflish could, you know, recuse himself, and this body could decide somebody else, or the body could decide. Does it have to be somebody on this body, or could we bring in somebody from the outside? You know, I, I haven't had an opportunity to review whether it would be appropriate that perhaps, I think what you're referring to, Alderman, is maybe a third party of some sort, an outside, uh, perhaps a, a retired judge or something of that sort. Certainly, I think it's a possibility. I certainly think that the, the statute and the uh, case law, which is the DeLuca case that Attorney Biskupic has been referring to, I think it does allow for some variance uh, in dis determining who's going to be the person to preside. I, I certainly think there's a, a lot of latitude and flexibility there if the council wishes to consider it. Just one follow-up. Go ahead. Just to clarify roles, if we were to go to that step and you know, have the quasi issue, is it my understanding that Attorney Biskupic would actually be the one questioning the witnesses, doing the prosecution, and then you would be basically our you know, guiding light, if you will? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that would be correct. Uh, Attorney Biskupic would be entrusted with providing the prosecution and presenting witnesses and evidence. My role uh, in, that, uh, in the event that there was a, a third party presiding would be to advise the counsel, and, and that, that role wouldn't really change a great deal depending on who may be presiding. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Is there any other questions from the council members of Attorney Volkner? I see no further questions. Uh, Alder Person Kittleson, would you please call the roll? We have a motion and a second. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Alderman Van Akron. I don't have any questions, but I certainly would like to add to the discussion. I, I don't have any questions of Mr. Valkner, but I'd certainly like to make a statement if that's. Would you want to do that after we take the vote or before? Bef before we would take the Go ahead. vote. Thank you again. I guess I, I would urge the committee to focus on what is directly in front of us, and that is the investigation. Do not get caught up in, in the, the, I guess, long term. Um, we're strictly talking about going forward with an investigation, um, which Attorney Velker himself has said 
you know, he believes that we do have some responsibility to go forward with. Um, Attorney Biskupic is willing to do that for free. Attorney Belkner has stated that he doesn't believe there would be a great cost for his firm to at least go forward with the investigation. Again, if, if there is found to be no merit or no substance to these allegations and to the complaint, we'd have the option at that time to end this process. Um, but I do think it's also important, as Attorney Belkner stated, it is his role to ensure the integrity of this process, to ensure that we follow the letter of the law, even though there are some in this room that may not want to go forward with the process, I think everybody should feel that we, if we do go forward with the process, we're doing it in the correct fashion. We are doing it to the letter of the law and we have the integrity of Mr. Belkner's um, assistance to make sure that we are doing this the proper way. Again, I, I think we've passed resolutions. We've discussed this many times. I think we have an obligation to go forward and I think we have a responsibility to make sure we're doing it the correct way. And, and I think at this point, we're doing it the most cost effective way that we can. So I, I would urge the committee to um, retain Mr. Belkner's services and we, that we move this process forward. Thank you, Alderman Van Akron. Alderman Raisler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as from the start, I have obviously been the uh, person who's been uh, against some of this for the financial reasons as far as not wanting to get into offense, uh, Attorney Wagner. Um, spending any money uh, on the process, uh, having obviously seen the vote on uh, number seven where we have moved forward to uh, do the investigation. I, I guess I'm comforted by the fact that Attorney Wagner is not going to be charging us anything until we get to the point where a decision at least needs to be made as to where we move forward. So I guess I'm I'm kind of swaying on that, uh, the financial thing, as the fact of um, we're not going to hopefully have a bill until we get up to the uh, final result. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Riesler. Uh, any other questions or comments? Any questions for Attorney Volkner or any other comments before we take the vote? Again, we have a motion and a second uh, <coughs> authorizing the Common Council to engage the services uh, of Attorney Joseph J. Volkner of Olson, Cloet, Gunderson, and Conway. Alderperson Kittleson, would you please call the roll? Belt. Aye. Boren. Aye. Carlson. No. Decker. Aye. Hammond. No. Hammond. No. Heidemann. Thanks. Koth. Aye. Kittleson is aye. Matichek is excused. Rinfleisch. Aye. Riesler. Aye. Sampson. Aye. Van Akron. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Versi. Aye. We have 11 ayes and three noes. Motion carries. Mr. Chairman, can I be excused? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you for appearing. Uh, President Rinfleisch, did you still have a prior obligation tonight, or are you I, able to stay? I do. I need to finish up my, my route, if that's acceptable. You are excused for thank the remainder of the meeting. Next, we'll move on to uh, item number nine on the agenda, which is council document number 1036. And item number 1036 is submitting a communication from Milt Storm expressing his displeasure with President Rinfleisch, the Sheboygan Press, articles and some older persons asking the mayor to resign and asking that the common council rethink the reasoning and compassion, their reasoning and compassion before they make an ultimate decision on removal. I see Mr. Storm is in the audience tonight. Did you wish to speak, Mr. Storm? Well, that's a loaded question. Come right up. You're not on the public forum, uh, uh, Mr. Storm, so you will have greater latitude, but. Uh, For the record, Mr. Storm, would you uh, please give your full name and address? My name is Milton R. Storm, and I live at 1736 Marvin Court. Excuse me, Mr. Storm. Uh, uh, Attorney McLean uh, in, uh, 
recommended that we uh, have a motion to open the floor. Motion. Second. We have a motion and a second to open the floor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Alderman Raisler, did you have something? That was what I was All right, there. thank you very much for that point of order. Uh, proceed, Mr. Storm. Well, it's very difficult for me. I'm not prepared because this resolution I had was at least over a month and a half ago, <coughs> I believe. And I'm sorry I did miss a couple of the council meetings because I was up in Sturgeon Bay and have many obligations to do. But the reason that I do, I have been here in Sheboygan since 1961 when we first made the mayor's office a, 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 a full-time position. I've known every of the mayors. I've known, uh, starting with Amon Muse. I've known all the, uh, Joe Brown, uh, Roger Schneider, Richard Schneider, Richard Shusha, who I have no respect for him. I'm sorry, Richard. But when I hear some of the things that are going and I'm out in the public, it is amazing how people are disgusted with this council. That you're supposed to be do representing me. My uh, representatives don't even represent me. I caution them how to do and they don't even listen to me. So what good is it for me even to speak? And for Alderman Reinflesch, uh, he ought to talk to uh, Anthony Bonet. I met him at, at the August uh, Rockford's ride when we do our fundraising for Neighbors Against Drugs for Johnsonville Sausage. And he works for Johnsonville Sausage. He says that Mr. Reinflesch was a uh, greenhorn. And he's the one who came in with Mayor Perez. Mr. Storm, no personal attacks, please. This is truth. Well, I, I, well, I don't care for some of the, like Pat Aho and the, some of the comments she made, by, like snubbing and and the words. I, I've known her too. Okay, well, we're good. I'll try to be more reasonable. But I've been attacked by even some of the older persons here and some of the things, and I'm sure they all know who I am. So if there, anybody's got any questions, why I put that thing in, and I have also a dispute with the Sheboygan Press. They ought to apologize to me for some of the ways they have treated me. Thank you, Mr. Storm. Uh, My suggestion is just to drop the whole thing and we're done. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Storm. Alderman Hammond, you're first. Uh, thank you, I'd make a motion to file. Second. We have a motion and a second to file. Uh, Document number 1036. Uh, should we do a roll call or all eyes okay uh, on that? All eyes is okay. Uh, all in favor of filing the complaint, uh, say aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes aye. The document is filed. Next on the agenda, we have council document number 1118, <laughs> submitting a communication from Mike and Diane Werner stating that they believe that the correct action for the council regarding the mayor is to allow the recall effort to continue and live by the results of that effort, <coughs> which will be the will of the people. Is Mr. and Mrs. Warner in the audience tonight? I don't believe they are. I, I did contact, uh, in fact, I contacted Mr. Storm and I did leave a message for the Warners. Uh, I got their answering machine. Uh, is there any discussion on this document or I will enter or I also will entertain a motion. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, I'll motion to file. Second. We have a motion and a second to file. Any further discussion? All in favor of filing, say aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes aye. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, Alderman Hammond. Okay, there's, I think there's some problems with the button, at least mine. Uh, it's probably my rookie mistake in pushing it. it. It doesn't. Let me try this. Try it again. Oh, there you go. There you go. Did you want to make a comment? No. We're okay. Just making sure it works. <laughs> What's that? Just making sure it works. Next we have uh, item number 11, council document number 1151, submitting a communication from Richard W. Susha stating, is upset with the press conference that attracted all the news media. Uh, Mr. Susha, did you have, want to make any comments on your, uh, on your uh, document? No. Okay. Alderman Hammond. Uh, motion to file. Second. 
We have a motion and a second to file. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. Document is filed. Now we've come to that portion of the agenda where we're going to do part two of the public forum. So if any, anybody would like to speak on the rest of the agenda items, uh, 12 through 17, having to do with our discussion on uh, the city administrator, amongst some other items, who would like to be heard? Start with you, ma'am. Alderman Born, Mr. Chair, you're my wife. At some point I want to talk. Go ahead. <laughs> no. All right. There you go. Thank you. Would you state your name again for the record, Dulcie? <laughs> Dulcie Johnson, 1306 North 3rd Street, Sheboygan. <clears throat> go ahead. <clears throat> Um, I strongly support a city administrator and a part-time mayor, but you need to hire a qualified person or you'll just create more problems. The draft study of the UW-Whitewater showed that the department heads and managers and the employees of the city of Sheboygan support hiring a city administrator. <clears throat> the government structure committee in July 2010 endorsed a city administrator <clears throat> with broad-based training in municipal management to provide consistency through the implementation of common policies, procedures, and provide continuity. The responsibilities <clears throat> would include hiring of employees, planning and directing work in consultation with the mayor, appraising performance, rewarding and disciplining department heads, addressing complaints, resolving problems. It would require an advanced degree, such as an MBA or an MPSA, at least 10 years of progressively responsible work experience in a municipal setting with a minimum of five years functioning in a leadership position. Experience in human resources management, knowledge of performance measurement, knowledge of principles and practices of public administration, knowledge and significant experience in long-range planning of programs and services, considerable experience in team building, planning, organizing, and directing the work of others. <clears throat> Those are the criteria that were established by the Government Structure Committee, which met for several months, maybe it was even two years, I don't know, <clears throat> but it was a long time, and I hope that you will not throw out their good work when you decide on this issue. Um, <clears throat> the city shares the county uh, economic development coordinator to the tune of $100,000. I think that's money well invested. Adam Payne has saved the county millions of dollars, <clears throat> and I strongly support the city going with the city administrator. And also, you need to uh, create a referendum on the February or April ballot <clears throat> to call for a part-time mayor position. Uh, the people can still vote for a mayor, but it would just be a part-time person, and you need to find a qualified, qualified city administrator to perform the day-to-day -day operations of the city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else want to be heard? Uh, Mr. Lottie, you'll be, nec you'll be next on the agenda, uh, next agenda item. This is still the public forum. Thank you. Anybody else want to be heard? Uh, yes, sir. Step forward. State your name and address again for the record. Uh, again, Richard Susha, 15 North Point Drive, Sheboygan, Wisconsin. I'm pulling this out of my previous comments. I commend your efforts to install a city administrator and to make this more revenue neutral. However, you're leaping into a major structural change by prematurely filling that position with a person who is only knowledgeable in finance, not public administration. And that's not just to get rid of Ryan, I hope. Don't exchange one mistake for another. I suggest this evening you amend the resolution to st state interim or acting administrator immediately when taking up the agenda item. 
Therefore, tonight, I urge you to adopt the city administrator and temporarily fill that position on an interim basis only. And Dulcie said it before, you'll need to set the groundwork for a spring election referendum to decide whether there is to be a full or part-time mayor. This is a gut-wrenching problem that you're all going through now. I don't envy your job. Thank you, Mr. Susha. Does anybody else from the audience wish to be heard? Step forward, sir. Thank you and good evening. I'm Eldon Berg. I reside at 406 Clement Avenue in the great first district of the city of Sheboygan. And uh, I'd like to speak specifically to document 1164 from the past city office holders. As a group, our tenure spans four decades at approximately 120 years of elected service. Although we've served in different times and political climates, we stand united in our concern for the city of Sheboygan and unanimously support your current move to establish a position that will provide professional day-to-day -day management of the people's business. As long as we're in a historical mode, I would be remiss if I didn't I recall that for many years, the city was served by a position that served much like a city manager. That position was titled the risk management officer and more recently the mayor administrative officer. Mike Hotz served three mayors and numerous councils researching policy issues, mediating between council, uh, mayor, and staff. And about 10 years ago, then Alderman Val Schultz presented a panel which included the Wisconsin League of Municipalities and the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance to specifically discuss the city administrator's position. Uh, the accompanying resolution was filed with the consensus that the mayoral administrative officer was currently providing many of the functions of an administrator. And as councils tend to be conservative over the years, the thought was if we were to call him an administrator, we'd like to have to pay him more money. So that was the reason for filing. Thus, in an earlier time, the city had been served with a very similar position that did not compromise either the role of the mayor or council. You know, although historical information may be helpful in providing context and background, this is clearly not about the past. Your action on this matter and the other matters on the agenda tonight offer a rare opportunity to create your history for our future. I thank you for your service. You have a long night ahead. And I can assure you that the chairs you occupy were not specifically designed to be comfortable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berg. Mr. Berg, I'd like to thank, I'd like to thank you for, uh, if you've had a ch chance to check your email the last day or so, uh, he sent, uh, Eldon sent out an, a number of uh, uh, articles, or, or actually a report from the Government Structure Committee. And also there was a document, I don't know if you had time to email that I requested at Eldon, the, the working with a municipal administrator, what should the governing body and staff and the administrator expect? Were you able to find that one, Eldon? Oh, well, I, had, I dug it out of my heirlooms and it was, it was very good. If you could find it, uh, or maybe I can see that it's email, but it's, it's very good because it, as I said, it, it uh, kind of uh, sets everybody's expectations. It's very well done. Thanks again. Uh, does anybody else want, from the audience want to speak on, uh, in the public forum yet tonight? Going twice, three times. Thank you for everybody that uh, took the time to uh, speak at the public forum tonight. Uh, just before I go into the next agenda item, since uh, uh, Mr. Berg referenced item number 141164. Uh, I'd entertain a motion on that document. Alderman Hammond. Um, motion to file. Second. second. We have a motion and a second to file document number 1164, item number 14. Any discussion? Alderman Hammond. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would just like to take a moment. Uh, I know. Uh, former Alderman Berg and many on that government structure committee spent you know, 2009 and 2010 going through that um, and did put a lot of hours into that and, and for the city's benefit. And I'd just like to thank them for that. Um, and the Alderman that came forth with the letter and, uh, sorry, the uh, past mayor as well that came forward with the letter recommending that, so. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Any other comments? 
Uh, we have a motion to file document number 1164. All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. Now we'll go back up to number item, item number 12 on the agenda, and that is Alderman Ron Lottie of the City of Plymouth is in attendance and will give a presentation on the process the City of Plymouth used to hire their Director of City Services uh, Administrator. Mr. Lottie, would you like to step forward, please? We need a motion to open the floor. Motion. Second. We have a motion and a second to open the floor. All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. Just for the record, uh, Mr. Lottie, would you like, would you please give your address? Uh, yes, my address is 32 South Park Place in Plymouth, and I'm a 4th District Alderman and served the City of Plymouth for 22 years. We went through the process of looking for a City Administrator many years ago, and I went to a referendum and was voted down. And over that time, I think we didn't have the continuity we needed in operating our city. We were wasting money, wasting time, each department had wound up with nine bosses. We've got eight aldermen and a mayor. So every time one alderman would say something to the department head, then you dispute it with another alderman or the mayor, and we weren't getting continuity. In uh, January of 2009, uh, we convinced the mayor that, uh, council convinced the mayor that we should form a committee to study an administrator position. Well, it took until in January, you appointed two other persons to that committee, and then we didn't appoint a citizens to that committee until March. And then we kind of floundered around for about two months. We didn't know where to go or exactly what to do, and we hired a, a consulting firm. We went back to the council and convinced them to give us about, I think the number was $15,000 for a consulting firm to come in and lead us in the right direction. Well, we went out and did, and we hired Voorhees and Company on uh, Deer Lake Road in Sweet Deerfield, Illinois. And I can tell you, they came in and Excuse did a me, phenomenal Excuse me, Mr. Lottie, job. what was the name of that firm? Would you spell Voorhees. it? Voorhees. Would you spell uh, it, please? In fact, I can give you their thing here. It's just so that she can get that in the minutes. Thank you. Continue. And uh, they came in and did a fantastic job. We didn't know how they were going to proceed first, but they came in and they sat down individually with each alderman and each department head and the mayor and we told them what we thought we needed. And then they, they came back to us and said, okay, now they knew what we were looking for. They could take all our comments and put them together. And they knew the committee did not want to interview 30 or 40 people. We didn't want to go through that process. They put out the brochure of our, for the position. They picked, I think, eight people. They interviewed the whole group first. 30 or 40 people. Out of that group, they picked about eight because they knew what we were looking for. Out of that eight, they brought to the committee. We interviewed those eight people and narrowed it down to six. And then the, those six of those people, we took to the council, or the part, we took it to the council, they narrowed it down to four. Came back to the committee, we looked at it again, took that four back to the council, and we wound up selecting one out of that four. And it was about a good year's process we went through because we didn't get our administrator on board until, I think it was September of 2010. We started this in January 2009, and I can tell you people, the city should have done it 20 years ago when I first got on the city council. The, the continuity we got now is just fantastic, and I can also say almost to the letter, every department head was opposed. They were just opposed because now they're gonna have someone supervising them. They couldn't have nine bosses. And to this day, there's not one department head would do without this person. They just love them. You know, they, they made their job half as hard, and it also made the council's job easier because now we got one person to deal with. Instead of every council member going to every department and get, trying to get something done, we go to one person, and then we, had, we set up the structure, uh, how it worked out, and, it, and I'm telling you, it's just great. We should have done it a long time ago, and I would urge this council to seriously look at that. I can also say that when we talked about an administrator first, and it was defeated in a referendum, when we started the process again later on, and we, we looked at administrator, we kind of got the feeling if we put the word administrator out, it's going to get defeated. So we kind of changed it to director of city services slash administrator, and it went, it's just great. We, I don't think the city of Plymouth would be without them. And if you go the route of hiring them, I hope you don't try to pull our guy away from us, because we need him. <laughs> he is. 
He's a 28-year-old person, and he comes originally from Boston, Wisconsin, and uh, <coughs> just fantastic. And he saved us in one year. He's been on, on, on our employee in one year. He's, in the one, first year, he saved us over three to four million dollars. The city of Plymouth, our, rate, our taxpayers, and our and our utility ratepayers, because we own our utility. He saved us over four million dollars. We don't expect to get that every year, but right now, for the salary we're paying him. He's paid for a salary for 20 years in less than one year. I urge you seriously to really give it a lot of consideration. Thank you. Are there any questions from the council for Mr. Lottie? Alderperson Kittleson. Thank you. Not for Mr. Lottie, but thank you. But Voorhees, I, I, if aldermen have checked their email, we, we just this afternoon received information from them um, regarding a city administrator. So I know I, I, I did try calling the number. I didn't get an answer. but. Um, just so you know that the information was all sent to all of us, so thank you. If, if I may, I would just say that Voorhees, when they came, there was some administrative work that was done by our, our, local, our, our local people, our, our clerk's office and stuff. They helped them out with some uh, administrative work, but other than that, I'm, these people were fantastic. You know, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Oh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have item number 13 on the agenda. A discussion by the older persons on the future of the position of mayor for the city of, city of Sheboygan to take effect after the April 13th election. A discussion on the merits of a full-time versus part-time mayor and a possible referendum on the issue before I open it up for discussion, uh, I believe uh, Attorney McLean mentioned to us and I, uh, a few months ago, or maybe it was even last year, that in order to set the salary for a new mayor after April 13th, the salary would need to be, t be determined by February of 2012. Is that correct, Attorney McLean, or in that neighborhood? Uh, the current ordinances talk about the uh, setting salaries for elected officials, I think uh, at least 13 months before the term is to begin. Um, I think council can, uh, that, that's what you've established as your uh, policy and your ordinances. So um, whenever that is 13 months before April of uh, I think it's February. Uh, and then also Attorney McLean, I believe you mentioned to me recently that uh, if we were going to change from a full-time to a part-time mayor, just to make the change, to say nothing about an, a referendum on the issue, but that would mean a charter ordinance also would have to be done 13 months in advance uh, to change to change this from a full-time to a part-time mayor? Um, if I understood you correctly when I talked to you about it? The timing wouldn't necessarily be 13 months in advance, but the timing would be governed by uh, I believe there's currently a charter ordinance in place that says the mayor will be full time. So in order to change a charter ordinance, uh, you can only do that through another charter ordinance. Charter ordinance is, uh, is an ordinance, but it's, it's different from just a general ordinance in that uh, it requires <coughs> two thirds vote. Uh, and uh, there's provision in a charter ordinance that uh, if uh, there's a request for a referendum uh, filed within 90 days of the uh, charter ordinance that uh, the ordinance doesn't take effect until you have the referendum election. Uh, so there would not necessarily have to be a referendum election, uh, but if, if a sufficient number of uh, citizens petition for a referendum, a referendum would be required. Wouldn't, wouldn't mean uh, to say that you could not, in any event, the council could decide to have a referendum on the question, but that you wouldn't have to unless uh, the appropriate number of citizens filed a request. Uh, Attorney McLean, would that be a binding, a binding uh, referendum or advisory? Um, would that be our decision? If, if the council chose to have a referendum just uh, at the council's request, uh, you could do it either way. If, if the referendum were uh, 
the petition for a referendum were filed by the citizens and a sufficient number of votes, a sufficient number of uh, signatures were obtained on that petition, uh, that referendum would be a binding referendum on whether or not the charter ordinance was effective or not. So that would, would be binding. Thank you. Alderman Hammond. I've got the gremlin in my light. Um, just a couple quick follow-up questions, Attorney McLean. Number of petitioners, how many? I'm assuming it's a percentage of something. Um, and then while you're thinking of that, the 13 months, is that prior to the election or prior to the term beginning of the, of the mayor? The, so the salaries are 13 months prior to the beginning of the term. The okay. term of the mayor begins uh, uh, when the council sworn in, I think, April. It's like uh, a week or two after. Mid-April mid yeah. uh, of 2013. So it'd be 13 months prior to that date, not prior to the election. And as far as the number required for a referendum on a charter ordinance, um, I'd have to double check. I, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Do you have anything else? No, it's off now. All right, good. <laughs> Alderman Reisler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just uh, for clarification, uh, and for me who is not knowledgeable, could we, could we have the referendum on the February primary? Or would it have to be on during a regular the April election? Uh, it would depend on the timing. Again, if you're talking about a uh, uh, sort of a voluntary referendum that the council decided that we want to put this to a vote to the people, um, you could get it on the February election uh, primary, I believe, assuming. Uh, that the timing met the statutory criteria for uh, getting something on a, on a ballot. And uh, I believe you'd be able to do it by February. You wouldn't be able to get it on the November general election, but uh, I think you would be able to by February. Thank you. Uh, I would like to hear some discussion from the older persons <coughs> on what your thoughts are of uh, maintaining a full-time mayor or going to a part-time mayor, I any advantages or disadvantages that you see in that process? Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, myself, and I've said this to just about everybody before, that uh, if we do move forward with the uh, city administrator position, that uh, I, I don't think we can go with a full-time mayor at it. You're winding up with dual control, and I've, I've described this several times. It's not D-U-A-L, it's D-U-E-L. And you'd have to eliminate that, that uh, problem there with the city administrator, the full-time mayor, where you're carrying those kinds of salaries at that point in time. And I guess the, the question that I have at, when, we, when we go into this, I, I, we all like the idea, but if we're going to get this referendum going, and there's some legwork that's got to be done with this, can we have all the legwork done uh, before we put this to referendum so if it it does hit, we know exactly what we're getting into. And then, then I guess then the question I have, maybe this is for the attorney, uh, can it be implemented as such? I, new to the council and, and, and the workings on that one, I'm not exactly sure how that it works. I know when the referendums go forward, you have to know why and the hows. But is it something that we can have all the legwork done, black and white, and the referendum <coughs> present to the, the people and can be implemented right, on, uh, right after the fact? Uh, I apologize, uh, Alderman Hammond. I'm not sure if I understand your Hammond. question. I'm Hammond. <laughs> don't, don't worry. I got here. A lot. <laughs> I didn't uh, say any D in my head. Anyway, uh, I'm not sure what your question is. It, uh, the the referendum on or and the charter ordinance on making the mayor's term part time as opposed to full time is really a separate issue from whether or not they have a city administrator. Uh, uh, okay. Um, I, I, I and, and that, and that go is... Go forward with the city administrator position uh, at any time. Okay. I, yeah, well, and I guess... Could, I guess would that you please stand? Oh, sorry, that, sorry, sorry, Mr. Chairman. I think at that point in time that it's... it's we're back to that, that two salary thing. I, mean, I, I, I like the idea. I really like the idea. It's, I, I, I think I fall in the same boat as Alderman Bourne and Alderman Heideman. I leave dermal ridges on pennies, and I, I just don't see uh, carrying those two salaries. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. I believe uh, 
Alderman Hammond is next. Must be my bad hearing attorney McLean. I thought you said Hammond. Um, just a, a couple quick things um, on the discussion. Um, you know, again, the, the city administrator um, conversation and part-time, full-time mayor, I think, is, as Attorney McLean mentioned, are, are mutually exclusive um, events. Um, I do feel very strongly, though, that a mayor, um, the mayoral decision should be a referendum decision. We shouldn't even bother with the two-thirds charter ordinance vote. Um, uh, just write to referendum and, and go that route. That is a, that is a big decision. Um, and it, uh, citizens should make that decision. Um, if they decide to keep a full-time mayor, you know, again, if it's a good full-time mayor, I don't have a problem with paying two salaries because, again, the mayor can provide vision and direction just like this council should, but also can be an economic development cheerleader for us too. And if that mayor can go out and bring in 200, 300 new jobs, they're gonna pay for themselves um, many times over. Uh, from an economic development standpoint. So again, I don't have as much of an issue with the full-time versus part-time other than I think it should be a referendum um, on that particular issue because again, you know, that's an elected position and the electorate should decide whether they want a full-time or part-time. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would agree that if we are gonna make that change, it should be done through uh, an election through, through um, um, I forget, I'm lost on the word at the moment, but. Um, Referendum. Correct. It, it should be done through that process if we're going to make that change. I guess my question would be in reference um, to the salary of the mayor, whether we keep a full-time mayor or not, what is the protocol and how could we, if we saw fit to change the salary of a mayor due to the fact that if, if we implement a, a chief uh, administrative officer, um, obviously there's going to be some, some duties that are going to be shifted from the mayor's office to that role. Is there a protocol or, or um, a process that we could then change the salary of the mayor? Um, if we would keep a full-time mayor in the future going forward, would that have to be after the election? Is there a 13-month window to do that and so on? If you could, I guess, touch on that. Uh, the council cannot change the mayor's salary during his current term. So you can't, well, you, you, can change, you can't reduce it. So. Uh, you can't say for the last year or so that you know we're going to drop you from wherever you are now down to twenty thousand on the basis that you got less duties. Uh, any change in the uh, compensation for the mayor would be uh, can only be made effective for the next mayoral term. So uh, if you put in place a city administrator uh, in the next you know, six months, uh, you'd still have a mayor uh, by charter ordinance is full time and uh, his salary is set for the balance of his four year term. Okay, and if we wanted to change that come in the election, whether or not there's, um, whether he's full time or part time or so on, would that require the same 13 month notice to change the salary and compensation package of the mayor's position? Um, the, the ordinance calls for setting the salary of an elected official for the following term, 13 months prior to when they take office, yeah. And, and the intent of that is to give those desiring to run for the elected office some idea of what they can look forward to in salary. Uh, it's not really fair to get people to run and then all of a sudden uh, they, they get in and you say, well, we're only going to pay you $10,000, you know. Yeah, I can, certainly, <laughs> I can certainly understand that and I would agree that that's certainly how we should go about it. Um, you know, as former Mayor Susha pointed out, there has been someone in this role previously or, or somewhat of this role. I think it does um, work having two people in a role similar to this. Um, I think we should go about looking at a referendum, but if e either way with the duties of the mayor's office changing, we certainly should look at the changes um, in his compensation if this goes forward. Thank you, Alderman Van Akron. Go ahead, Attorney McLean. Thank you, Alderman Warren. Um, at the, I was at municipal attorney's conference uh, up to noon today. I talked to a city attorney from uh, Wauwatosa a little bit uh, uh, on city administrator and mayors. Uh, they've got a full-time city administrator. Uh, their 
their mayor, it isn't designated whether he's full-time or part-time, but they only pay him based on part-time salary. Uh, but you've got to look at what we currently have in our charter ordinance calls for the mayor to be full-time. So you could not change the charter ordinance. You could say you've got to be full-time, but only pay him $10,000 a year. You could do that. I mean, whether somebody would run for that position might be another question, but. Alderman Racer, thank you, Alderman Van Ackeren. Uh, just a, a point of clarification uh, for the city attorney. I know like in elected officials for like the sheriff and other ones, they only actually have to report to work for one day throughout the year. Uh, you know, would that be the same for the mayor um, statutorily that even if he was full time, we paid him $10,000, he really would be able to function as a? Yeah, they need to perform their duties, but there's nothing that says that they've okay. got to punch the clock. Although. Uh, uh, our, we do have an ordinance as far as uh, full-time elected officials cannot engage in private business during normal work hours. So, uh, so like, you know, I'm elected, I, I couldn't uh, go into private practice uh, mm -hmm. sort of on a part-time basis during the work hour and uh, still function as an elected city attorney for the balance of the term, you know. Thank you, Alderman Riesler. Uh, just I want to make a couple of points. Uh, before I make my points, we'll call on Alderman Belt. Thank you, sir. I just have a quick question. If we consider this, the mayor, a part-time mayor, um, would we have to basically schedule his hours as to what he would be working, what he would be required to work? I mean, uh, I guess there'd be a minimum that he'd have to work, wouldn't there be? Um, not necessarily. I think you'd say he's not going to be full time and you're not going to compensate him based on a full time. You know, you, you could set a salary for the mayor and uh, they could put in as much time as they wanted, I suppose. Uh, but all you're going to pay him for is, uh, you know, uh, so, much, so much money. The, the reason I ask that is that if this is going to be a part-time mayor and we're not allowing him to do other work and other jobs, um, we're kind of going to shoot ourselves in the foot as to who we're going to get to do this. You're right now the restriction is based on full-time mm -hmm. elected officials. Uh, if part-time, we would have that same and restriction. You would, you would want to change that. Yeah, we would if have we to, to change that down. restriction. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Belt. Alderman Koth. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, of course, I'm in favor of a full-time city administrator and also a full-time mayor, but you're throwing around that $10,000. Um, if our mayor at this time is full-time and with the benefits and the wage is over 100000 you know, even at a, a full-time mayor with part-time wages even at a $50,000 a year. That's still a very good wage. So, you know, full-time mayor without a referendum, part-time wage, you know, we still have time for that. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Koth. Uh, I'm, uh, my, my impression was uh, that right now we're paying the mayor about uh, total all in with salary and benefits about ninety thousand dollars but I could I could be wrong on that it could be a hundred thousand with with benefits uh, uh, one other thing I want to mention as far as talking about a part-time mayor recently with the uh, governor's bill pass, uh, budget passing uh, previously our what we called our schedule X employees where we did not have to pay health insurance or into the Wisconsin retirement fund was n was not over 600 hours a year with the governor's new budget that's been increased to 1200 hours and if you multiply that by 52 weeks we could have a part-time mayor for 20 or 21 hours a week and hypothetically have a salary of 20 or 25 thousand dollars and if, as long as they stay under 1200 hours you would not have to pay health insurance or into the Wisconsin retirement fund now I would say that a salary of twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars for a retired teacher, 
uh, a retired alderman, um, a retired businessman that would go out and represent the city would be a nice little job for a retired person at that salary. And that person, in all likelihood, if they are retired, maybe wouldn't need health insurance or wouldn't need uh, a retirement fund. So that, that's a possible option. Uh, I guess I, I favor the city, I personally favor the city administrator, uh, but I do have a problem in maintaining a full-time mayor. Uh, I believe uh, lat when, when the city was looking at this a year or so ago, for a city the size of Sheboygan, I heard different stories of uh, salary and benefits of, of up to 140 or $50,000 for a city administrator. Uh, that remains to be seen what it would be. But if we would go to a part-time mayor with like a Schedule X employee, uh, that alone, if we would use the $20,000 figure for that part-time mayor, would give us approximately seventy dollars or $80,000 towards that uh, salary of a very qualified uh, city administrator. I believe Alderman Carlson is first. Thank you, Chairman. I guess I um, would be very much against that because, once again, I think we'd be uh, narrowing the pool of qualified applicants. Even though it is a part-time mayor, the person st should still be qualified. Um, so I would uh, go along the lines of keeping a full-time administrator and a full-time mayor because it's been proven over time that an administrator will find efficiencies and save money that could pay for that job and a full-time mayor. But I wouldn't be opposed to lowering the, the salary for the full-time mayor because, once again, Fifty, sixty thousand dollars. I mean, that's still a great deal of money. Thank you, Alderman Riesler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can we make a, an elected official a Schedule X employee? What was that? Could we make an elected official a Schedule X employee? I, no, I don't. No, I don't really believe so. So that's from. The, the, that's a good philosophy, but I don't think that's something we can legally do. He's a public official as opposed to an employee. Yeah. Is that, uh, what, if, what if that was, uh, just a follow up to Alderman Raisler, what if that was the criteria and it was known ahead of time that that's what the job was gonna pay and there were gonna be no benefits? Well, I think you can establish a position of mayor that would be set the salary and say there's not gonna be any benefits, um, but I wouldn't call him a Schedule X employee. Okay. And therefore, it wouldn't matter how many hours he worked. He only has to work one hour if he wants exactly. to. Exactly. Right. That's where we get but, back to the... But, I, but if you were going to set up the position, perhaps you'd want to have a, a minimum of 20 hours a week or 25 hours a week, whatever. That, that, those are discussions that we'd have to have. I believe Alderman Hammond is next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I echo Alderman Carlson's, um, you know, if we're going to take this road, I don't want to gear it towards a specific group of people. Maybe that wasn't your intent in your comments, and right. I apologize if it wasn't, but, you know, we need to be able to draw from the largest talent pool possible and, and just trying to focus a position on retirees doesn't um, <coughs> you know, really make any sense to me. The second point I'll make is regarding um, you know, number of hours work. You know, the, the taxpayers will keep the mayor accountable for how many hours he or she works. You know, so if that individual is elected and decides to work the one hour, four years later we'll have a new, new mayor. Um, so I think you know, what goes on in City Hall will be um, you know, number of hours worked, if you will. Some of it's statutory, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Attorney McLean, they've got to preside over meetings, those types of things. So I think uh, whether, you know, putting an hours commitment on it, again, it may not be a real prudent thing either. Um, set the salary and the taxpayer will decide whether or not they're doing an effective job inside of City Hall. Alderman Versi, thank you, Alderman Hammond. Thank you, welcome. Sure. I can quick piggyback off of that is setting a salary, you can also set his job description. He has to, like right now, if a mayor has to preside over council meetings, present us with a budget. You can do the same thing with a full-time mayor reducing his salary, saying he has to go to this meeting, whatever committee he's part of, he has to chair that committee that's putting his hours in. So you set his job description up, you don't have to do anything with hours. It's, he has to go to these meetings, he has to present the budget, he has to, or whatever his duties would be. So I mean, that. Keeping a full-time mayor, reducing it to you know less than fifty thousand, you know forty or fifty, you're still getting a qualified person to come in here and be the cheerleader of our city. So um, that's what we would do is just set that job description up. Thank you, Alderman Versi. Yeah. I thought somebody was going to ask this question, but they didn't, so I'll ask it. Uh, Attorney McLean, is it uh, specified 
that a mayor has to be a four-year term or could it be changed to a two-year term? Um, you could set the term uh, any way you want. It, it, I think, again, it would require a charter ordinance to do that, but okay. uh, you could make it a two-year term. You could make it a one-year term. You could, uh, it's really within the discretion of the city as long as you do it by a charter ordinance to uh, establish the term. Uh, any, other dis any other discussion on item number 13? Uh, I've got one, I've got one, just one question. Uh, <clears throat> what would be the process, Attorney McLean, for the council to decide after a the April 13th, uh, uh, April 2013 election, whether we want to uh, consider uh, going to a part-time mayor or keeping the full-time mayor? Would one of the aldermen have to bring in a resolution for perhaps saying, uh, bringing in a resolution saying that we want to go to a part-time mayor and have an up or down vote on that, and that would kind of finalize it? Would that be the right procedure? Um, well, one way to do it would be for an alderman or multiple aldermen to sponsor a charter ordinance to, uh, to do whatever you want to say in the charter ordinance, make the term, uh, or make the position a part-time position. Uh, change the term, whatever you'd want to propose. Okay. But I think that... And then again, the, that we'd have to deal with the idea that, of the referendum. That also. would be necessary because, uh, again, there's a charter ordinance in place that says the mayor is a full-time position. Uh, just having a voluntary referendum would not change the charter ordinance. Uh, you'd have to... Uh, uh, you know, unless you made the referendum uh, question a, uh, a question that would change the charter of the city, and that, that gets a little more complicated, but um, I think that, that could be done. But, uh, the easiest way would be to bring in a charter ordinance establishing what you want to do, uh, vote that up or down, uh, and that's then if... Uh, that really leaves it up to the electorate then if they don't want to do that, they've got to uh, file a petition for a referendum on that. But if they were in support of it and didn't want to change <coughs> that, there would be no need for a referendum election. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alderman Carlson's next. Thank you, Chairman. So if I'm hearing correctly, if we did, um, did a voluntary referendum and it did pass, or if it failed, and we went through with the charter ordinance, the residents could still ask for another referendum because yeah, the first one would not be could, could do a a, a non-binding sort of advisory referendum this february on the question of should we have a part-time mayor uh, if depending on the outcome of that vote uh, again that would be nine non-binding you could then the council could take the results of that and decide to bring in a charter ordinance then that's in keeping with the outcome of that vote. Uh, if you did that, then that would be a charter ordinance that would uh, uh, do, let's say the electorate uh, favored a part-time mayor. So you brought in a charter ordinance to create a part-time mayor position. Uh, that would be <coughs> subject to a referendum if sufficient number of uh, signatures were submitted within 90 days of the date of that uh, adoption of that ordinance. If the electorate were satisfied with the outcome of that and, and with the charter ordinance, then you wouldn't need to have a separate, another referendum election. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Carlson. Alderman Van, Alderman Van Akron is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess just to confirm some of uh, Attorney McLean's comments, if we went forward with just keeping a full-time mayor but changing the compensation package, that wouldn't require a charter ordinance change? That would just be changing the compensation 13 months ahead of an elected official. It, it obviously doesn't require a... Um, Wouldn't call for a referendum. Not, that's not a, not a referendum charter ordinance. That's a general ordinance just to establish Correct. a salary. But, it, but if it, the public and the citizens were disapproved of that action, they could still come forward with the petitions to have a part-time mayor if that's what they felt was appropriate, correct? 
they could submit petitions to do that, but in order to do that, it requires a change of the charter. The current charter says it's a full-time position. Uh, just submitting a general petition for a referendum doesn't change the, your charter. So uh, it, it would give some sentiment to the council, though, that uh, and maybe the majority of the council would want to do that, is then uh, adopt a charter ordinance to change to a part-time position. Okay, I, I think that answers my questions. I, I guess I, I would urge the council to, if we go forward with this uh, chief administrative office position, to then consider the compensation package of a full-time mayor, consider, um, again, the change in duties that are going to be involved. We can look at lowering that compensation package, but at the same time, considering, again, keeping open the largest pool to, to gather from, um, I, I think that will require fairly well paying wage, not as high as it is now. I think it does require health insurance and those type of things, again, because you're asking for someone to give up, you know, four years of their life into this position as a full-time position. Um, I, I think we need to then pay that person um, adequately. Again, is the mayor's office going to be losing some duties to the chief administrative officer? Absolutely. Um, so so I, I'm okay with, you know, looking at varying the compensation, but I would certainly caution against going to the point of twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars and no insurance and those type of things. I think we really restrict the pool of applicants at that point. Thank you, Alderman Van Akron. I believe Alderman Carlson is next. Are you I did. Mm, you're good. This is the last time I'll speak. I, just to piggyback off um, Alderman Van Akron, I, I think it's just important to um, keep the integrity of the mayor's office. So I, I just would like to echo I fully support just cutting the pay down a little bit, but um, like I said, keeping the integrity of the office will, I think, um, appease the general public, and, but uh, cutting it down to part-time uh, lessens the office. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Carlson. I guess the only, the only, the only comment I would have to that is that if you're going, if you're part-time mayor, is going to be almost entirely ceremonial uh, and then probably would have some responsibility for running meetings, but ma mainly ceremonial as far as, you know, going to grand openings, ribbon cuttings and all that kind of stuff, the ceremonial stuff. Uh, I don't think it has to be that elaborate of a salary uh, for those kinds of duties, but I think then if we, if we stay with a full-time mayor and we do go to the city administrator, I guess I would agree with Alderman Van Akron, is we'd have to look at the duties that the mayor is giving up that the city administrator is going to be doing and setting the salary accordingly. But uh, I still would have problems with paying a full-time mayor $70,000, and it's obviously going to be more than that uh, as the track we're on right now with paying the mayor at least $70,000. Uh, and the mayor is going to have reduced responsibilities when we go to the city administrator. I think we have to take a serious look at what that salary is going to be. Thanks. Uh, Alderman Sampson, you're next. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess some folks feel like I just woke up. But um, I guess am I off base here by saying that it's potential that this does not go to a referendum? If, if the decision here for referendum is only if we decide or, or between a full-time and a part-time mayor, if we discuss keeping a full-time mayor position and just change the pay or decrease the pay, that does not have to go to referendum, right? right. So it is, it is entirely possible that we're going to maintain a full-time mayor, make a decision to decrease that person's pay at the beginning of their term, and then add a full-time administrative position without having to take this to the people in a referendum. It, it can be entirely possible that's how it can be done. Is that what I'm hearing? That would theoretically be possible, yes. But then again, you have to you know, weigh what sort of candidates you're gonna get. If you reduce the salary significantly and you're requiring it to be a full-time position, uh, you're asking a lot because uh, you do have an ordinance that says you can't really engage in other employment while you're full-time with the, with the city, so. Uh. I, if, if I can add to that, I guess my, my point is that 
we can make this whole decision right here without actually getting any public input. We can we can decrease the pay to a public reasonable referendum, not input. Referendum, whatever public input. I mean, the public is going to vote on something like that. So I mean, we could just say, well, we'll make fifty thousand reasonable. <coughs> That's fair, uh, and then just this whole decision can be made right here. Thank you, Alderman Sampson. I believe Alderman Hammond is next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess uh, uh, you know I would agree with you if it was purely a ceremonial position, you know, go with a part-time mayor. But I I don't look at this position um, as a ceremonial position. Um, again, I think uh, the taxpayers will ultimately decide. But I think having uh, a mayor, and I kind of echo some of the comments made earlier, uh, having a full-time mayor, we can talk about the pay, but that's focused on economic development. It's focused on the bigger picture, the vision, the direction of the city on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, all of us have um, uh, what I like to call real jobs. Um, can't be here all the time, but having somebody whose sole day-to-day -day mission is the, the bigger picture, I, you know, I don't see that as a ceremonial kind of position. And I think, candidly, something that's needed. City administrator, whatever the position you want to call it, is really designed to do the day-to-day -day functions in City Hall, something that, candidly, elected officials are horrible at, at primarily because they're trying to make everybody happy. Um, and it's very difficult to do that as, as an elected official or as uh, somebody's boss. So that city administrator is really the day-to-day -day operations, the mayor at that point, and of course this, this body um, is responsible for the vision, direction, and um, economic development efforts of the city. And I think that's more in a ceremonial position in my mind. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Uh, is there any further discussion on item number 13? Okay, thank you for the, the discussion. Uh, we've already uh, dealt with item number 14. Item number 15 is council document number 1163, an ordinance amending section 29-75 of the 1975 Sheboygan Municipal Code as to add, delete uh, positions in the mayor's office and the finance department table of organization. Mr. Chairman. Alderman Van Akron, I believe you're first. Can I just ask for a short five minute break before we go into these next two? I'm assuming this, these two are gonna be pretty Second. in depth since we've been at yeah. this for nearly two hours. Sure. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's see, we've got, uh, let's uh, reconvene at <coughs> nine o'clock. Oh, now you're a young guy. <laughs> <laughs> municipal code so as to add, delete positions in the mayor's office and the finance department table of organization. Alderman Hammond. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first off, I would ask uh, if we could take uh, 15, 16, and 17 together. They're basically all revolving around the same thing. 16, or 15 is changing the table of organization. 16 is um, the position and 17 is the resolution that uh, we passed um, just establishing the position. Uh, I'd like to have the discussion, I'd like to have some discussion on each one individually because I've got some, if other aldermen don't come through with some, some of the things that I had in 1163 then I'd like to make some comments but I want to uh, have the aldermen discuss it first before me. So are, there, are there any discussion on 1163? Alderman Versi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, with 1163, what you have attached here is also the job description, um, which I have some severe issues with. Um, if you want to try and put this through, if, and Attorney McLean, maybe you can add to this as well. Even whatever goes through here still has to go through salary and grievance for the job description of this, correct? Yes, I believe it was referred to both committees. Okay. So, um, as in light of everyone being here, uh, if you guys want to turn right to your, the job description of the Chief Administrative Officer, the number one, two, five, six, all of these, anywhere that uh, you would see, like the first one, development and implement of annual budget under the direction of the Mayor and Common Council, I would strike out the Mayor and put strategic fiscal planning, which is all the chairman of all, the, all five committees. And the next one is the same thing, under the direction of the Mayor, no. Strategic Fiscal Planning and Common Council. That's where I have the problem with all the direction yet and all the input from the mayor and all these other um, statements in here with all the direction from the mayor yet from this city administrator. Uh, 
before I call on Alderman Hammond, Alderman Versi, did you want to make that in a form of a motion to delete what you said to delete and uh, put in what you said to put in? If I could. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, and I believe what Alderman Versi said is that on the on the first page where we have the uh, City of Sheboygan Chief Administrative Officer, grade 16 underneath there, it says reports to mayor that the City Chief Administrator uh, Officer would report to the mayor. Alderman Versi is proposing that that would read that reports to Strategic Fiscal Planning Committee of yeah, the Common I'm Council. Sorry. Or did you also want to leave Common Council in there, Alderman Versi? I want Common just Council in there as well. All right, so, so it would, it basically would be anywhere that it says mayor. Wherever, it, wherever it says mayor in the document, uh, take out the word mayor and change that to Strategic Fiscal Planning Committee and the Common Council. Jim, under discussion. Under discussion. Um, I just want to clarify a few things, and I apologize, I'm going to take a little bit of time with this, but I think it's helpful in the discussion because as I spent the time formulating this, um, I considered a lot of these things. Um, first off, there are certain things that right now is, um, Alderman Kittleson, we were talking during the break, um, and Steve, um, please jump in if I'm incorrect, but there are certain things that the mayor is still statutorily required to do in presenting the budget is one of them. So the mayor, and again, we need to focus on this position as bigger than what's going on right now in the city. You know, even a full-time, part-time mayor, still gonna have to work with this position um, and um, so things like the budget, they're going to have to consult together. Now whether you want to change the wording under the direction and change consult with, I don't have a problem with that. But they are still going to get, again, looking past this issue we're going through now, that position is still going to have to work with the mayor. Um, there's no way around it. We're here part time. Right now the mayor is full time. Um, and as long as part of the mayor's responsibility is budgeting, they obviously have to work together because it's the mayor's responsibility to present the balance or present the budget to the council. As far as the strategic fiscal planning, I thought of that. Um, you know, if you're trying to take that control away from the mayor, well, the mayor appoints the committee heads, and the committee heads make up the strategic fiscal planning committee. So, if you wanted to go that way, then it should be the common council in general, um, and you know, strategic fiscal planning. In the document, you'll notice that as far as reporting, <coughs> it's the common council president and there's input from the mayor in the performance evaluation. So, but it's the common council president. Hiring um, was the common council president, vice president, committee as a whole, and the mayor involved in that as well. Again, taking current personalities out of this, um, this individual, whoever he or she may be sitting in that chair behind us, you know, has to work with this individual. So again, on the hiring process, you've got three from the council, one from the mayor's office, and again, they're just making a recommendation to the council. So the university, a lot of those things had kind of worked through, um, knowing that, again, that position has to work with the city administrator. A um, couple things with regarding um, the structure. Should we just, because there's other things I wanted to chat or go through on this, or do you just want to cover I, this part I, for now? Up to the comments you made so far, I just want to make one comment if sure. I could before you go on. When we were talking about this a couple of years ago, a, a department head who's now retired, who shall remain, uh, who shall remain anonymous, said to me that Alderman Boren, I'm all for going to a city administrator as a department head. However, I want to know where the buck stops. Is it with the city administrator, or is it ultimately that I re that I uh, report to the mayor? And uh, I think that's very, very important. If we're going to go with the city administrator, as far as I'm concerned, that's where the buck should stop. And I don't want department heads getting uh, instructions from the city administrator. And if, if it's this mayor or any mayor, uh, because then we're going back to what we had before when we had uh, Anthony Bonet and Mike Hutz. The mayor was still in the picture. Where did the buck stop? Uh, I think it's very important for the department heads to know where the buck stops. And that's why I, I, I would support Alderman Versi's motion in some form that the department heads know when we go into this 
that if we're going to have a city administrator, that's where the buck stops, and and they're not the set, the uh, city administrator is not going to be second guessed because the mayor is is going to be is also going to have the uh, the city administrator's ear on making ultimate decisions, and that's from a, re, uh, a, a, a department head two years ago when we were discussing this, and I think he was speaking for other department heads that ultimately they want to know where the buck stops. And that's why I think if we're going with the city administrator, I think we have to be very careful how we set this up. Now, if you want to continue, Alderman Hammond, fine. Thank you. If I can address that, um, if you, again, through the document, um, I think it documents well that the department heads would report directly to the city administrator. Um, if we want to argue that the city administrator um, performance review is done strictly by the council, I don't have a problem with that. If we want to argue that the city administrator reports strictly to the council, I don't have a problem with that either. But the document well illustrates that the department heads would report to this new position. So the buck for them would stop there. Um, where the buck doesn't stop is for that city administrator. You know, that is, they would report, or that individual, I should say, would report to this body. Um, and again, I'm looking at the bigger picture that, you know, the mayor should at least have some input in that performance evaluation. I'm not saying it should be the one, the, the one conducting it. And the termination of said position would be done by this body as well. Um, so again, there's not a whole lot of authority that the mayor has in the city administrator position other than input. Um, they have no authority, if you will, to, to fire, hire, or reprimand a city administrator. So um, let me give you, a, I guess, kind of through this, um, the structure, because there's been many questions that have come through on um, positions and, and so on and so forth. So I'll give you some food for fodder. As I <coughs> was thinking through this, um, you'll notice one of the, the resolutions is to eliminate, or one of the ordinances is to eliminate the finance director. The vision of this is Director Modio is now on a four-year contract, um, with the, or four years left of his appointment. Um, so in my mind, logically, at least for the next uh, several years, he would become the, the, whatever the position we call it, city administrator for lack of a uh, better way. At that point, certainly we, at that point we would have the ability as this body to either reappoint or go out and do the search um, that we'd need to do. If we decided not to do that way and create a city administrator, leave the director Amodio in his current position, of course that would be an extra item on the table of organization and additional cost of, of about a buck fifty all in. Um, so my rationale for putting him into that position um, was that um, he's here, he's doing a great job, um, certainly qualified um, based off of his past experience um, to, to do the position. Um, and we wouldn't have to create a separate position on the table of organization um, to do that. So um, whether we call him acting or what have you, if we decide to eliminate his position and go out in national search, we still have to pay out his, his contract with the city because he can only be terminated for cause and of course we have no cause. So that was the rationale for creating it that way. Um, it allows for us to get a city administrator reporting to the council. Puts a very qualified individual. I've had the privilege of working with him for the last year. Um, he saved the, saved the city tons of money already um, through what he's been doing in the budget process. Um, but again, the key here is it's relatively cost neutral um, because we're not creating a whole new position. So I just wanted to give everybody kind of my rationale through this. It wasn't cronyism. It wasn't designed to, as a favor. It was looking at how our table of organization works now and being able to fill. Because you also notice through your ordinance changes that we changed the, the title of the, tre or of the uh, deputy finance director to strictly treasurer. Part of the idea, again, is to bring more of a business acumen and business atmosphere to City Hall. Um, so taking away the deputy director's titles and moving them to um, you know, treasurer development, um, which is where Chad is at now, and then eventually changing the titles hopefully will foster more of an environment of business in City Hall. Um, so that's kind of the rationale behind the structure of, of what we what I what I proposed. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Uh, Alderperson Kittleson. Thanks. Um, you you just changing the t the deputy director, then you're changing that just to the title of treasurer, correct? 
her title currently is deputy director slash Correct. treasurer. We're just dropping the director, deputy director title. And, but nothing else will change. It's Correct. just the title change. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Person Kittleson, uh, Alderman Versi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was along with that most, most of the step of the way on that. I still think um, <laughs> as far as um, putting out the national search, you can have the finance director moving into there, which is a very smart financial move for the city, obviously, because we're going to, if we, if he does leave within his four years, we have to pay him out. But as an interim uh, administrator, whatever you want to call that title, it takes time to get that search out. It would, you know, maybe we'd only end up paying a year and a half or two years out, if, if that, of his, of his salary. And also the second part of that is, um, what you said earlier on the, the mayoral or duties, um, police and fire shouldn't be separated. They should also, they are department heads, which should also go to the city administrator <coughs> because they are also departments. Thank you, Alderman Versi. Uh, Alderman Hammond. Th thank you, and I apologize uh, for butting in. If, uh, Attorney McLean, please correct me, but it's my understanding under city statute or, or ordinance at this point, I believe it's a charter ordinance or it might be a general, police and fire um, report directly to the mayor, so we'd have to change that. Um, that's the reason I didn't put them in there. That's, that would require a, a two-thirds vote um, to do that. That's statutory, yep. that, that the, the mayor is sort of the commander-in-chief for the police and fire. Uh, it was part of the reason, Alderman Bourne had asked me that question, part of the reason why I was talking to the city attorney of Wauwatosa, because they have a city administrator, and uh, they did not do a charter ordinance changing that statutory responsibility of the mayor, but uh, I was advised that as a practical matter, the uh, police chief and fire chief basically report to the city administrator there. And, uh, you know, if, if the mayor were to issue some order to the police chief, they'd be bound to follow it. But, uh, you know, in practice, they currently report to the city administrator. So, can I just follow up on that, Alderman Hammond, sure. the attorney? Uh, so what you're saying, Attorney McLean, if the mayor wouldn't voluntarily relinquish the responsibility of being uh, that the fire chief and police chief report report to the mayor. If he wouldn't voluntarily give, voluntarily give that up, then we would have to do a charter, charter ordinance to accomplish that? No, it, the statute doesn't talk about reporting to. It says, uh, um, I don't have the statute with me, but the, uh, basically that the, the police chief, I'm not, not so sure, says the same thing about the fire chief. I don't think it does, but police chief that is under the command of, or under the uh, direction of the mayor. From the standpoint, if the mayor issues an order, the, uh, the chief has to follow that. But it doesn't say that the chief necessarily reports directly to the mayor. It doesn't talk about reporting, but uh, it's uh, the mayor can command the police chief to, to uh, obey an order. And okay. I don't necessarily think, at least, uh, at least from what I heard from this other city, uh, it doesn't appear that it's really necessary to change that statutory uh, responsibility and get the uh, results you're looking for. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't advise putting something in the uh, excuse me, the job description specifying that indeed the police chief and fire chief would report to, uh, would report to the city administrator on administrative items? You could put that in there, sure. Okay. Alderman Hammond? Um, and again, as we were going through this, I had, had thought about that as well, and, and Attorney McLean's absolutely right um, for things like, you know, I guess, uh, emergency orders, all that stuff, the police chief would take direction from the mayor. Mm -hmm. um, but from, a, you know, again, we all know where the buck stops when it comes to money, and that's the budget guy. And all of those processes would still go through the city administrator. Um, and so, you know, I guess you can put in for administrative, because if you look again at part of the change would also be things like, from an administrative standpoint, the assessor's office would report there. Of course, the assessor has to remain independent for his other functions, but the clerical type duties would report there. HR would report, IT would report, DPW, the whole gamut. Mm -hmm would report for administrative functions and those other positions, as I mentioned, for also re, uh, reporting and performance review. Um, but 
the fire chief and the police chief would report more from an administrative function because of the budget requirements um, and that type of control, but the police or the mayor would still have the obligation um, or the duty for emergency purposes. Well, I, I guess my concern would be, let's say for example, the city administrator said to the police chief, I, wanna, I want innovation done in this particular part of your department to save money and you gotta have it done in 90 days. Uh, what I need clarified is that if the city administrator makes that directive to the police chief to get this done in 90 days, I don't want the mayor chiming in and say, well, no, you don't have to do that. Well, again, keep in mind that, again, the city administrator is a representative of this body. So if the police chief decides, I'm not gonna do that, the city administrator could very well come back to this body and say, we're recommending we do this, and this body can say, police chief, go forth and do that. Because again, ultimately, you know, the police chief and any department director can be terminated by the vote of this body. Um, no? Police and fire chiefs are oh, terminable so, uh, by the Police yeah, and Fire right. Commission. Police and fire They're hired by the Police and Fire Commission and fired by fire the Police and Fire Commission. I, my, I stand corrected, but okay. again, the city administrator could ask this body to, you know, again, go for it. <coughs> uh, getting, just before I call you on, on you, Alderman Sampson, I just want to get back to what Alderman Versi was talking about, and that is, I still have a problem under this chief e e administrative officer reports to the mayor I still have a problem with that now if we want to we want to change that that the chief uh, that the mayor can advise or however we want to word it I, I'm uncomfortable with the chief administrative officer re reporting to the mayor because I with the reasons I stated before in past history that we've had here in Sheboygan when we've had that person below the mayor that maybe wasn't called a chief administrator uh, wasn't called a chief administrator officer or a city administrator but was kind of charged with running the day to day but yet at the end of the day the buck didn't stop with that person it stopped with in many cases the mayor and I want to avoid that that's that's my concern uh, Alderman Sampson sorry to keep you waiting no, no problem thank you Mr. Chairman just a, just a quick one are we losing any positions here because right now what we're, what we're doing is right now Jim Amodio is finance director so he would in this scenario, move to human resources director, whatever we want to call it. But we're still looking at hiring a human resources manager, right? If I, if I could, Alderman Bourne. Uh, I'm we sorry, human resources, uh, city administrator, right. sorry. We would be losing the director of finance position. Um, that would go away under this new table of organization. Um, in the research, and again, having shared that position now for a better part of 18 months, um, we feel pretty strongly that uh, uh, with the budgeting being part of the city administrator, uh, city administrator's role, that the finance department could continue to function quite well without a director. You know, and again, you have the treasurer, who in most organizations, again, is going to be the head person uh, in finance. So we would get rid of the deputy or the um, uh, director of finance, have a treasurer position, which would essentially lead the finance department. And again, in some of the other positions, for example, we don't have a director of development we, it's on the TO, but hasn't been funded in a couple of years. Um, you know, eventually cleaning some of those things up. Um, but in this, in this ordinance here that we're talking about now, we eliminate the director of finance position. So if I can follow up, so, so the position that we approve then for a human resources manager since Tom Rice is? That would continue on. So we would still hire right. another individual for human resource? We, we would have to do that anyways. As, as Director Rice leaves, um, we'd have to have somebody in HR no matter what, whether we had a city administrator or not. I thought at one point we were gonna say that since HR was going under the umbrella, so to speak, of finance, that that was all going to be kind of just operated under Jim Amodio's position. It was, but it, it, that HR person would still be a position, an HR manager position would still be there. It's just now, instead of reporting through that channel, we report to the city administrator. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Sampson. Alderman President Kittleson. Thank you, Chairman. So then, just uh, my understanding, then the finance director will slide into city administrator. Treasurer then becomes head of the finance department. Well, again. Or how, how what, what, or slides into that position. Her, her title just changes. I mean, right now Correct. she's deputy director, treasurer. Her title However, would change. The title change, but then that person 
is in charge of the finance department. Is that what you're saying to me, ultimately? Oh, I guess you could say ultimately. Um, she would be the lead person in, in this case, if anybody knows Nancy Boss, would be the lead person in that, in that area, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alderman uh, Hammond, I just want to play, before I call on Alderman Koth, I just want to play devil's advocate here. What would, what would be the possibility of keeping the finance director the way it is right now and keeping Nancy Buss in the position she's in right now mm -hmm. and just giving Mr. Amodio the interim job of chief administrative officer uh, interim and then later do our search for a city administrator and then when that happens potentially we've lowered the mayor, the mayor's salary if we decide to do that and do our search for a city administrator and then at that time we hire a city administrator, Mr. Ramodio just goes back to being finance director. Again, the whole, the cost. You know, now you're funding two positions. You're funding the finance director. And if you look at the job description, yes, there's some administrative things. And again, keeping the personalities out of this for a minute, there's some administrative issues, you know, directors reporting to the city administrator. But largely a lot of that position is budgeting, budgeting and financial. Um, so again, uh, you could do what you're, you're presenting, Alderman Bourne, but again, now you're creating a new position and an extra level of cost that I just, I personally don't think you need when I've looked at, again, you know, what, the, what these guys are doing now. And again, I've had 18 months to watch this, um, watch this play out. What they're doing now, what the role of the city administrator is, um, I think you could easily eliminate that position and save the taxpayers the, the hassle of having two positions with duplication. Because the finance director, and again, um, the, the great people on the government structure committee um, in the packets that they handed out from 2009 and 2010 indicated, and all city administrators do this, is part of their responsibility is budgeting. So now you've got a city administrator responsible for budgeting and a deputy or a director of finance responsible for budgeting. Um, I think you know, there'd just be too many overlaps. It wouldn't make any sense to have both positions. Thank but you. you. To, to make them acting, if we want to call them that, um, I don't have a problem with that. I just, then we have to address what happens when the acting title is gone and you know, how much do we want to pay out of his salary to him um, to finish out his four year you know, commitment. Because again, he's got a four year appointment, can only be removed with cause. So if we terminate him before the remaining portion of his four years, we have to pay him out. Thank you. Thank I you. don't want to keep all the person Koth waiting any longer. Go ahead. All right, thank you, Chairman. So the way this document is drafted at this time, if we move uh, the finance director into the city administrator, He's there for four years, right? Either way, he's here for four years. Okay, either way, but we will not be actively looking for a city administrator for at least three years. If actually, we won't have one for another four years. So all this talk of city administrators actually for oh, nothing. If no, that's not that's not correct, okay. Alderman Koth. The Jim or Alderman or Jim, um, too many Jims. Director Amodio would move into that position, but he would assume this new responsibility. He would report to the council all of the things in the job description would happen. So he would go from being director of finance to city administrator with all the powers, responsibilities, and duties of that new position. So yes, we would have a city administrator with his body in it, um, effective whenever this body decides to do that. So um, the, the finance director position would go away. We would have a city administrator. Thank you. You know, what you're, what I, we wouldn't have done a national search for a city administrator. But all the responsibilities, the reporting, all of that would be that of a city administrator. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to follow up, Alderman Kath? Well, it, it makes absolutely no sense to me. So we all this work again, city administrator, um, but we're not really going to actively search for a city administrator the way this is, doc is drafted. For another four years, we're, we won't have a... I guess I don't understand why you say we wouldn't have a city administrator um, because you know we didn't do a search. Then the person is not a city administrator. It's, it's like saying uh, I can't even come up with an analogy. I mean, the, the individual would be a city administrator. He's got all the duties, responsibilities, and reporting of a city administrator. He is the city administrator. It's not even like it. Um, the difference is we didn't go out and, and do a national but, search. And and to that standpoint, when you look at the job qualifications, the current director of finance fulfills all of them. He's got an MBA. He's got um, 
experience managing people. He's got experience with finances. Obviously, he was a CFO um, of a large multi-organization, um, I guess. Um, you know, so he, from, from a qualification standpoint, he qualifies. Um, we just didn't do the national search. And again, my vision of that was because I didn't want to fund two positions at the same time. Now, if this body decides to change that, you know, that's fine. I'm just trying to make it cost neutral for the taxpayers. Thank you, Alderman Codd. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Alderman Van Akron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess from my understanding of the discussion and the, the, the resolution is, is that this really is the only way to keep it cost effective and keep it cost neutral. If we keep the finance director in his position and add a city administrator, we are now adding a six-figure plus salary and compensation package. Um, for me, anyways, it's looking at the long-term picture, not just the next four years, but the next you know, 40 years. It's about adding this position to our structure. If four years from now we want to do that search, so be it. Um, for right now, it's, it's really changing the way we do business for the long term, not, not who's in the mayor's seat and not who's going to fill this position. It's about making it cost effective now so that I can really support this. I, I can't support adding a six-figure salary to our budget under our current conditions. You know, we're talking about getting rid of firemen and, and talking about not filling, uh, you know, vacant police positions and we're going to add a six-figure salary. I certainly can't support that. I support this resolution as it's drafted because, again, this is the only way to make it cost effective at this time. The savings we talk about with a city administrator position, a lot of them are potential savings. We're talking about actually actual savings off the table of organization right now. It's cost effective and, and, and possibly looking at doing the same thing in the other departments further down the line if, I, if I'm not correct. So, you know, we're, we're talking about making actual savings, not the potential of what a city administrator can do philosophy wise. We're talking actual off the TO type savings. I'm okay with that. I am not all right with adding a six-figure salary to our current table of organization. I, again, I think we need to consider not who's in the mayor's seat, not who would be taking this um, position. I think he is qualified. I, I think, um, you know, down the line, a nationwide search for a city administrator would be justified. But to make it cost effective and to make it work now, to make this change, I think this is the only way that it can be done. Thank you, uh, Alderman Van Akron. I just want to make a comment as far as doing a nationwide search for a city administrator. Uh, in my opinion, uh, a nationwide search for a city administrator with a master's degree in public administration and many years of progressive experience and demonstrated success and leadership in their current position and previous positions. In my opinion, we need a city administrator to come to Sheboygan with no preconceptions and no allegiances with a fresh approach and perspective. And that's what I think you'll get if you do a national search for a city administrator. Uh, I've also worked with Director Amodio for, since he's been here, been on the Finance Committee, and I, I have no problems with Director Amodio being the Finance Director. However, he only has one year of experience in city government. Don't get me wrong, he's done an excellent, excellent job as the finance director. But I have a real problem just handing him a four, another four-year four appointment without a probationary period. If we get a city administrator in here, if we do a nationwide search like we do with any other department head, I would assume that that's going to be a six-month probationary period. Uh, I, I strongly feel that we need somebody with a degree in public administration and, as I said, demonstrated success in their position that they have right now in that municipality and previous municipalities and come in here and be able to show us demonstrated savings in the community where they've been working. I think that's very, very important. So I would have no problem making a, motor, a, a, a director of Modio uh, a temporary chief financial law, chief administrative officer or whatever you want to call him. Uh, and yes, it may not be cost effective for the next uh, 15 or 16 months, but this is a long, long-term decision. And I believe, if I remember correctly, when this committee studied this for the city, I think they did recommend some autonomy between the city administrator position and the finance director. 
I think it's a good check and balance that you have there. If you still have a finance director, you have the city administrator. You've got that person with a strong financial background in Mr. Amodio. You've got the administrative experience. It's a very good check and balance. But I am uncomfortable in giving this position to Mr. Amodio, especially with a guaranteed four-year appointment. Uh, uh, I, can, I have no problem doing it on a, on a temporary basis until we can do a nationwide search. And again, we're thinking about cost effectiveness, not for the next 15, 16, 17, 18 months. This is a long-term decision. And even if it's not revenue neutral for a few months, I guess I can live with that, but uh, for the reasons I just stated. Next, we have Alderman Versi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're talking about length of time. Um, is it standard, or maybe I'm missing it on here, is there some kind of a, you know, standard with department heads we do five-year appointments? Is, am I missing it on here? I, is there no appointment, no years appointed for city administrator minus filling out his thing? And let me follow up with that. I don't think there should be any length of time that they're appointed. If we set up metrics, a set of metrics that council wants to see, you don't need to have a four, five, two, any year appointment for an administrator to come in. If he's doing his job, there's no reason for us to look elsewhere. It's as long as he's meeting his metrics, we never have to look, so he doesn't need to worry about an appointment. If we do get someone that comes in, we give him a four-year appointment, he's god-awful, we're stuck. Now we're gonna pay out another couple of years of his appointment, whether, unless it's very big due cause. And there again, it was with the metrics if he's not meeting it, so if I Thank you, Alderman Versi. Uh, I got Alderman Carlson. Could I call on Alderman Hammond? Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Um, I've got some other comments based off of yours, but I'll hold those to go in line. But to answer your question, um, it was intentionally written. If you look at the, the ordinance, um, again, because um, Director Amodio has got four years left on his appointment, we're not giving him a four-year appointment. He still has four years left on his original appointment. Um, and it can only be removed by cause by that. That's why you see that in there. After that, it's an at-will employee. It can be removed with, for, at the will of the council was how we drafted that. So your point's well taken. You know, if city administrator comes in, it's his council's discretion based off the metrics. If we wanna uh, keep them or go, there's no time period. It is truly at the will of the council. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Uh, Alderman Carlson. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, two questions. Uh, first one, in, in regards to uh, uh, Director of Finance, what, what would be cause? Maybe that's a question for the city attorney. Uh, it's the same language as the removal for the mayor. Uh, inefficiency, neglect of duty, misconduct in office. So I, I, I would like to three try quarters, to keep... By three quarters vote, that's, uh, that's called for in uh, the ordinance of the finance director right now for a department uh, head. Thank you. Obviously, we've gone past the point of keeping personalities out of this, but I, I, I support this ordinance as it stands for um, a couple of reasons. We've talked about the cost effectiveness, the redundancy of having the chief uh, administrative officer and a director of finance. Um, so suppose we move forward with this and we move um, Director Omodio into that position. He's there for four years, but if he's not meeting our metrics and not doing his job as set forth in this job description, wouldn't that be cause for removal? Because he wouldn't be ineffective, he'd be ineffective as the city administrator. So keeping the personal, personalities out of this, move this person into that job, and if he's not doing his job for the next four years, we could remove him. Thank you. I gotta Thank you, Alderman Carlson. Uh, Alderman Hammond, your lace is flashing again. This thing is goofy, but I, I <laughs> got the gremlin and you can hit the button and turn it off now. <laughs> the, um, a couple of comments. Um, first off, um, like Alderman Van Akron, it would be very difficult for me to support a city, and I'm a big advocate of, of a city administrator, but if we're gonna create a no, new position, um, it, it doesn't make any sense to me to do that. Um, and as far as demonstrated success, I mean, again, and, and this is no disrespect to anybody, but um, you know, I kind of welcome having somebody from outside of, of government, looking at what's going on inside of government. You know, if you look at the last, uh, uh, just going through the budget now, you know, he's already been able to cut $960,000 out of our current situation. That to me has demonstrated success. He's had demonstrated success as, as CFO of other places. 
Um, again, I think you know, municipal experience is great, but there's also said to be there's also something to be said for real world experience. Um, and you know, I am looking towards the future in this, um, and more than just the next year, two, three, as you can demonstrate by the way the document was written. It's an at-will employee of the council. There's no contract um, other than the one we're fulfilling out that we're obligated to fulfill out um, uh, for Director Amodio. And again, um, extremely qualified. Um, if you look at many city administrators, an MPA is not the only requirement. Um, MBAs um, fulfill city administrator duties throughout the country. There's you know, nothing that says an MBA is not as qualified as an MPA other than they don't have the, the public sector stuff. So again, I would, I would encourage this body to take a look at um, you know, what we're getting. I think we're getting a highly qualified individual. And again, trying to keep relatively keep the personalities out of it. Um, we're getting a city administrator um, that I believe is, is qualified and after the term is over, it's up to this body to, to go out to whatever search. We may look at this four years from now and say, we're gonna keep you, but now you're an at-will employee. Um, you know, I think we might be you know, prejudging, um, prejudging this a little bit. So again, I, I think he's already accomplished a lot of the things that uh, you know, we would look for in a city administrator um, if this was a, a blind search. So thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Uh, Alderman Koth. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would like to mention that um, Alderman Ron Laid from the City of Plymouth spoke to us tonight. Uh, the City of Plymouth spent $15,000, and the first year that they had their city administrator uh, saved this, uh, village, uh, the City of Plymouth uh, 3 to $4 million the first year. Um, also, the, the study that was done by the Government Structure Committee, uh, you know, they're saying that um, in most communities, an administrator is an at-will employee serving at the pleasure of the council. So even if we did a nationwide search, put in a city administrator, you know, they don't have a contract. There isn't a five-year contract for them. We put um, our finance director in that position. He's stuck there for four years and not an at-will. So, Thank you, Alderman Koth. Alderman Bill. Thank you, sir. Um, I'd have to agree with Alderman Carlson that if we move uh, Director Amodio into this position that if he doesn't perform, we always have that opportunity to remove him for cause. I mean, if he's not doing his job, because we're going to make the job description out, if he's not doing his job, he's not performing and we can, we can move him out. And that is cause. That is just cause. At that point, then, we'll go out on a nationwide search and find somebody. But I, I do believe cost effectiveness, this is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Belt. Uh, just a comment, uh, comment is that I think I would tend to agree with Alderman Koth in that if this is an at-will employee, I think we're going to have, and the person is not performing, we're going to have a much easier time getting rid of that employee if it's an at-will employee. If it's a contract employee, you're getting into all, you're opening up a can of worms if you want to try to get rid of that person. Let's say, for example, they have two years left. Are we going to have to pay that person out the last two years? Is it a part of an agreement to get rid of that person and then hire another person? That's the only problem I have with this being a contract position, is that if it's at will, and believe me, if that person is an at will employee, they know their feet is to the fire. They have to perform, because if they don't, they're gone. You got somebody with a contract, and I'm not just referring to Director Amodio on this, I'm talking to anybody with a contract. After that six month probation, basically, you're on easy street for the next four and a half years. And to get rid of somebody, once they're off probation, is very, very difficult. It's a whole different standard, in my opinion, than an at-will employee. Uh, let's see, we've got Alderman Sampson. I'd like to yield that over to Alderman Van Ackering. Thank you. Yeah, Apparently my work is not working either, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I guess just reiterating, I, I think the only way to make this cost effective is to do it the way it's proposed. I think we need to consider the long-term effects. It's about getting this position on our table of organization. Um, if I'm understanding correctly, at the end of this four years, it would be an at-will position at that point. Um, as Alderman Carlson brought up, if he's not meeting the requirements of this job description, it, we could remove him for due cause at that point. But either way, at this point, 
uh, director of Modio, which I agree is doing a, a good job, is here for the next four years in some capacity. And I guess I'd refer to uh, City Attorney McLean just to confirm that. We have a contract with him for the next four years if we would um, delete his position or I, I guess that's really the only way I foresee it going, um, we would then owe him the rest of the money for the rest of his contract, is that correct? Yeah, he doesn't have a contract. He's got a term, he's got a five-year term. Okay. And uh, there's four years left on the term. And I just uh, say as far as removal for cause uh, for, uh, it's basically what you're doing with the mayor. I mean. Right. That would require a quasi-judicial hearing, all that. It's different than at-will employee. The council could just vote by a majority vote to remove the individual without a lot of due process stuff. So there is a difference there. But uh, Correct, and, and I understand. And I'm not trying, trying to say that this is the best case scenario, but this is the scenario we're in. We either make it cost effective and we go ahead with adding this position, or, or in my view, I can't support going ahead with this position, and I, and I think there's others that have indicated that same problem. It's either cost effective and, and we add this position and we deal with the situation we're in, or I guess in my view we don't go ahead with the position. I, I for one, would rather see us go ahead with the long-term plan of adding this position under the current circumstances to make it cost effective if in four years, whether it be for cause or if at the end of four years we decide not to renew a term and put uh, Director Amodio in as an at-will employee or he decides he doesn't want it or for whatever reason we just want to do a nationwide shirts and he can reapply. Um, I think that's the best way to go, to get this position activated, to get this on our table of organization, to reorganize, to redo how we do government here and, and to get this started. Again, I think this is the situation we have to deal with and we need to move ahead with it. Thanks, thanks uh, Alderman Van Akron. Uh, Alderman Hammond, you're flashing. I don't know what this thing's been doing. Now it's green again. Um, I've got the Van uh, Aken, but you're gonna have to hit it again, Alderman Bourne. Go ahead. Goes. Um, you know, again, uh, it's not like a broken record here, and you know, to reiterate Alderman Van Aken's comments again, I think we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater here. Um, you know, we, we're gonna create this long-term position. Um, you know, I don't want to split hairs about a four-year term. Um, when we hired him on, and this body was the one that did it because we had to approve it. As the finance director, I think very few people can argue, at least that have worked with him on a regular basis, that he hasn't done a fantastic job. And if you look at his job description relative to um, you know, what the city administrator's position is, a lot of those things he's already doing in an unofficial capacity inside City Hall already. Department heads are already going to him as the go-to guy. So again, I don't want us to get so short-sighted on this individual that we, as Alderman Van Aken indicated, miss the big picture on this one. Putting the city administrator in is, is the goal here. We have the opportunity to do it in a cost-effective basis. Unfor you know, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, you know, we might have to slide somebody else into this position in a temporary basis, who, by the way, can do it and do it very well, in my opinion. Um, so again, I would ask that, you know, step back a little bit, and again, to coin a phrase, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater here. Um, no solution is ever going to be perfect, and I think this is a pretty, pretty good one. So. Thank, Thank you. you, Alderman Hammond. Uh, Alderman Carlson is next. I've got, it's been said by, thank you, Chairman. It's been said by Alderman Hammond here and Ben Akron, so thank you. Thank you, Alderman Carlson. Alderman Percy is next. Can I call a question? Yes. Second. Actually, did we ever get a motion on this? Yeah, we did have a, we originally had a motion by First. Alderman Bercy, do you have a motion? No, we didn't have a motion. Yeah. I made a motion to bring those three documents together and that you made a motion you to amend amend it. motion to change. Oh, that's right. We never made a motion. <coughs> Let's go back three hours ago. We had a motion by Alderman Bercy and a second by Alderman Belt. Yes. That was to amend it. We never had yes. an original motion on the document though. Motion by Belt, Hammond, to clarify. You stood up to clarify. We had right, a motion. but we never had a motion on the original document. We had a motion on the amendment that he wanted to make. Can we move forward after we vote on the amendment? I mean, we can still do the amendment and then go forward with whatever document we have, whether it's amended or not, after that, correct? Well, if, if I may real Alderman. quick, with, with that, you explained Alderman. everything down below, but didn't. it didn't, <coughs> reports two, mm -hmm. it still didn't get resolved. We were going to change it to uh, consult with or input from input or he wanted all okay. three. 
We're only on 1163. Yeah, we're only on 1163. Right, but we don't have a motion on that on the floor yet. We have his amendment, but we don't have a motion. And Attorney McLean, do we, we need a motion before we can have an amendment, correct? A motion? I yeah, it was my understanding that the way it was working was Alderman Hammond wanted to act on all three at once. The chair suggested just starting with the first one. I don't know if there was a formal motion to uh, put that on uh, for passage or not, but then there was an amendment. Uh, it's true that you really can't amend something that hasn't been put on the floor to begin with. I, uh, I just wanted to handle all of these individually because right. I think there's going to be discussion, all three of them. I, I I'd be per that. perfectly happy for you to make a motion that you put this 1163 upon its passage and then under discussion so we can do the amendment. So second. Moved. second. We have a motion Third. and a second to put 1163 upon its passage by Alderman Hammond, who seconded? Alderman Raisler. And now uh, we have already have a first and a second on the amendment and I believe the amendment was to uh, take the reports to, take the, the, any reference to the mayor starting reports to take the mayor out and change that if I'm remembering your motion correctly, Alderman Versi, uh, reports to Strategic Fiscal Planning Committee and the Common Council. And then down below, any part of the document that references the uh, mayor, change that to Strategic Fiscal Planning and the Common Council. Am I getting that right? You did, but I think I can, if I can, I don't know if I can retract that amendment from the, all the below. And we, we did discuss the reports too, which was the biggest sticking point for me, because going forward with the mayor, he does need some input on these. So I'm okay with now the full explanation on this and where it's going, just the top portion on the reporting too. However, that's gonna be reworded. Okay, so uh, you wanna make your motion then just the reports to, that the chief administrative officer reports to the strategic fiscal planning committee and the common council. Yes. Would you be all right with that, Alderman Bell? Yes, I would. With input? Is that what you're putting? Mm -hmm. is, there any, uh, is there any further discussion on that uh, amendment. amendment? Alderman Hammond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Or, <laughs> Please. It's going to be a long <laughs> night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was probably the wrong taboo, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Alderman Bourne. Um, I guess you know, the only comment I would have about having the reports to the strategic fiscal plan and the council, um, you know, I, I think I would just leave it the council, this body, with input from the mayor, if I could make that friendly um, amendment. Um, I think we've got points down further in the document that you know, talk about the hiring, the firing, all of those kinds of processes that you know, again bring that back within the council. Um, again, looking long term, keeping the, the current situation out of it. As I reiterated before my challenge, when I thought about the strategic fiscal versus the executive committee of the council, was that strategic fiscal is still appointed by the mayor by the committee heads that they appoint. So again, you could make that a somewhat political kind of position where the president and vice president committee as a whole are all elected by this body um, to be our leadership. So I would think that would be a more accurate representation of this body. So um, I would just ask for a friendly amendment to change that to common council with input from the mayor. Well, I'm just looking. Uh, I'm just looking, if I may, at number five under the, under there, where essential duties and responsibilities. Where if we leave consults with the mayor on uh, emergent matters requiring policy decisions, there again, uh, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Alderman I, Hammond. Again, I, I would reiterate: this individual still has to work with the mayor, and consults does not mean take direction <laughs> from. It just means get input from. Um, it's impossible and I think very um, short-sighted to think that we're going to be able to cut the mayor out of this process entirely. Um, still an elected official of the city of Sheboygan and should have some input in what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, again, the, the consults or input from like gives the mayor um, you know, the ability to still function in, in city government. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with a city administrator who again represents this body you know, also consulting with the mayor on policy matters that affect the city overall. Um, I would agree with you if it said the mayor can direct, but consulting does not in any way, shape, or form um, provide a, a direct line of authority. So. Thank you. Um, 
Gene Dead Legal Money. What is the, I, I just want to ask one more question to the council. Are, is the council comfortable with going ahead with appointing Director Amodio to this position four years, or do we want to make him, a, a, or the other alternative that I suggested before is why not keep the finance director and just make him acting chief administrative officer reporting to, as Alderman Versity suggested, the council? I think the only issue I would have with that is the finance director's current job description um, is that it reports to the mayor. So now you've got him doing a position that reports to the mayor and a position that reports to the council. And again, to me, it just doesn't make any sense. He's going to fill out the rest of his appointment and you know, we can continue to move forward from there. I, I, I think that creates even a bigger mess because again, he's now a master of two puppets and that just isn't efficient at all. Can't we have the uh, finance director re report to the uh, chief administrative officer only? So he's going to report to himself? And, and the council, well, yeah, okay, I got you. Uh, who's, I got a flashing light here, I got Alderman Van Akron again. I guess I would just like to, once again, call the question on the amendment and the passage. Uh, first, we, I believe first we'd have to vote on the amendment that uh, would make the chief administrative officer report to the common council. With input from the mayor. Input from the mayor. Second. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. <coughs> Belt. Aye. Oren? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Decker? Aye. Hammond? Aye. Hammond? Aye. Kath? Aye. Kittleson says aye. Rin, uh, Raisler? Aye. Sampson? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. And Versi? Aye. Is Corey here? We have 13. Yes, I am. 13 ayes. Uh, motion carries. Motion carries. Now we have, to, uh, we have to vote on the document. I believe. We were just voting on the amendment, so now we're going to be voting on 1163. We have a motion and a second to pass as amended. Please call the roll. I'm just going to write down pass as amended. Thank you. Belt? Aye. Warren? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Decker? Aye. Hammond? Aye. Hammond? Aye. Kath? No. Kittleson says aye. Raisler? Aye. Sampson? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Bercy? Aye. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve ayes. <coughs> one no. Uh, motion, motion passes, or document passes. Document. Uh, next, we move on to document number, uh, item number 16, council document number 1162, an ordinance creating division five of article three of chapter two of the Missile Code relating to the position of chief administrative officer. Alderman Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the ordinance be put upon its passage. Second. We have a motion and a second to put the uh, general ordinance upon its passage. Is there any discussion? Uh, hearing none, please call the roll. Belt. Aye. Oren. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Decker. Aye. Hammond. Aye. Hammond. Aye. Kath. No. Kittleson says aye. Raisler. Aye. Sampson. Aye. Van Akron. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Bercy. Aye. And again. Seven, I was eight, last. Ten, you have 12. 12 uh, eyes, one no. Uh, it general, general ordinance passes. Yep, same as last. Thank you. Yes. Next we have uh, item number 17, 
and that is council document number 1158, which passed the council on 9611, a resolution establishing the position of <coughs> chief administrative officer for the city of Sheboygan. And I just put a note on here because I knew we were gonna have a lot of discussion on this tonight, and, and that was a discussion on the comfort level of the older persons regarding the effective date of 12, I'm sorry, 10 11 after our discussions this evening. So the reason I put that on there before we, I open it up for discussion is I figured we were gonna have a lot of discussion on this and what were we gonna do and did we feel comfortable on moving ahead on 10-1? I guess, in my opinion anyway, before we open it up for discussion, these passed pretty convincingly and we've had our discussion, so I guess my comfort level would be to move ahead with it December 1st, but that's my opinion. I've only got one vote. Is there any other discussion? Fix my light. <laughs> Alderman Hammond. <laughs> you meant October 1st, right? October 1st. Yeah, yeah October December. 1st. It's okay. getting late. Yes, it is. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, the reason for the October 1st, um, again, because we already had the position in-house or the, the person in-house, it allowed us to get to that, that uh, position much more quickly and get that individual operating in that position a lot more quickly. As we're going through budget time, um, you know, again, um, the fewer distractions, the better. Um, so again, um, that was the reason for the 10-1 um, starting date. Um, there won't be any salary change for this position for the rest of the year. Um, so, you know, we're just sliding him into that, that position. So it's, an, huh? For this year. Make a motion. It's already passed. It's a resolution. Yeah, it's already passed. Motion. Oh, it's awesome. Discussion. Two. <laughs> I'm just clarifying. Okay. <laughs> so, thank, thank you. you. Shut up. <laughs> Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Yes, I just put it on. I knew I, I mentioned that it did pass at the last council meeting, but I wanted to revisit it. It's revisit it because of the further discussion we are having tonight. So there's no action on that. It's already passed. It was just for discussion. Uh, so where are we on the agenda here? We're uh, number 20 to set the next meeting date, and that's already posted for tonight, tomorrow night. Thursday, September 15th at 7.30 or immediately following the Festival Foods Open House or any other city committee meeting, city of Sheboygan committee meeting. Uh, there's a separate, uh, Alderman, I mean, uh, Attorney McLean. Yeah, motion there almost. Uh, just to clarify, during the uh, recess, I checked the statutes on uh, what vote it would require or what the number of electors it would require for a referendum and 7% of the votes cast at the last gubernatorial election. Uh, I think for the recall it's 25% of the votes cast so it's a lot smaller number. Uh, and I also double checked uh, uh, you can adopt a charter ordinance uh, and have that before it takes effect submit it to, the re to a referendum of the uh, electorate <laughs> And if the electorate approves it, then it becomes effective. So that, that might be what you want to consider doing. Thank you. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Get them around.